Hey, hello everyone. Hi. Hi, Hi Teddy. Hi, Nikos. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, guys. Oh my God, it's so good to see you finally here. It's show ten. Yeah. Really, I need to pinch myself because. Um, I've been awake for the entire show, and I can tell you that, <laughs> yeah, that I've been waiting for this moment for so long. It's so great to have you here. Uh, of course, first of all, thanks to our amazing host, um, Amana Nishan from Show 9 from New Delhi. It was really, really great. And all their speakers and the panels, really amazing show. Thank you, guys. And yeah, welcome to the grand finale. <laughs> Good. So, um, let me introduce Hello. myself first. I am Chaos Group's Community Manager, and it's my great pleasure to have my partner in crime today, Nikos Nikopoulos from Creative Lightning. <laughs> yes, he's the master of light, the master of cocktails, the master of light mix. <laughs> I do my best, I do my best. <laughs> you do, you do. Would you like to introduce our speakers today? Yes, that I can do. First, I would like to thank you everyone for involving this show and also for Chaos Group and Teddy for inviting me to be the host. It's a great honor for me. Um, also, it's great to see Ondra and Vlado in the same panel. I saw them last year in Los Angeles. And finally, through this event, which just happens, we're going to see each other again this year. So that's amazing, guys. Almost the same period. So let me start talking about who we have here today. Um, we're going to start random order. We have Vlado Koylazov, the CEO, founder, CPO at Chaos Group. And you can see here on the right. Hello. Hello, Vlado. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I don't think it's Christo here, but Christo Velev is going to be talking with us. He's a manager director at Bodo CPV FX. He's going to join us soon. I can see already we have Boyo Frederick from Post Office, Head of Visual Effects, and Richie Watimena. Guys, welcome to the show. Good day. Um, I can see as well Sonia is here, Christo, and Environment yeah. Architect at IO Interactive. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Great to have you here. Uh, you have a very impressive resume, I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. We also have Ola Prodel, the founder and director at Rough Format. Uh, Ondra, of course, he's the CEO and main developer of Corona Rendering. And he's Hi. also this. We have Tom as well, the marketing specialist of Corona. Tom, I think we spent two years talking on emails and, and, and the messenger, and here we are. <laughs> face Finally, to face at last. Yeah. Meet online. We talk yeah. about meeting a total chaos, but here we are. The opportunity arises. And then we also have uh, Job uh, Van der Steen. He's a general manager at EWE Connect. I think he's going to be joining us later for mm -hmm. the panel discussion. I met um, Job in his event uh, EWE many years ago. I think I've been there four times. I also present two times. It's amazing what the community can do. And finally, we're here to talk about community later on. And then we have Laurentiu uh, Stanciu, the founder of 3DS Romania Meetup. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, I haven't been to the Meetup, but I, I'm soon. Someday was going to happen. I promise you I'm going to be there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Great. So we this have an all-star lineup of speakers and guests. Um, and... But before we, we start with the presentations and the interviews and the panels, um, let me tell you a bit about the, the raffles and the giveaways that we're doing today. So the first great thing that we're doing is a raffle. Uh, you can win licenses for Vera or Corona, Autodesk, 3ds Max, Sinai software, and of course, one seat for Creative Lightning's Lightning class, right? I'm right, right? Yes. That's correct. That's yes. Correct. In order to join the raffle, you just need to go to the link which you see below and uh, fill in the, the short form there. The other thing that you can do in order to win some great, great prizes from Chaos Group, we have some swag. Unfortunately, I don't have it here with me, but I can promise you that the t-shirts and the notes, pads and everything is totally worth it. Um, yeah, you just need to take a selfie of yourself while watching the stream or just a photo of the stream and share it on Instagram, Twitter, or in the Facebook events that we created on the official Kios Group page. So go ahead, post some great images, and you can win some cool prizes. And the last of the announcements that we have today is that actually yesterday, 
we announced our annual student rendering challenge. Uh, every year, we invite students from all over the world to take part in this challenge that we're doing. We invite them to show us their excellence in rendering and show us that it doesn't matter that they're students, most of their work is really brilliant and with the top-notch quality. So the application deadline for this is November 30th. So if you're a student in um, computer graphics, just apply and there are also some great prizes that you can win. And we have Nikos on the jury panel. So yes. Nikos, <laughs> this I mean, year... You have, a nice, you have a nice topic, I have to say. Illumination is my thing, so I'm happy to be involved and I can't wait to see what all the students are going to make. And I'm sure it's going to be great and getting critique of your work is amazing. So I think that this world sign up, do their best and, and see what happens, you know, and we'll have amazing prizes as well. Absolutely. Yeah, but as you see, we are inviting you at everything we're doing this year. <laughs> I'm becoming an official member of Chaos Group. You should send me a t-shirt, I think. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so without further ado, I think we can start with our first presentation, The Secrets of Crafting a Photoreal Panther by Boyo and Richie, yes. right? Awesome. Guys, the floor yes. is yours. The stage is yours. That's good. Um, yeah, so do we share our screen? Yes, please. Okay, great. And then we cue you when we want to Add to be played, right? Let us know the team will play the videos, yeah. Yeah. Screen. Great. All good to start? All good. We're listening. Cool. All right. So, welcome uh, to our presentation. Um, my boy is Richie, and we'll be talking about uh, how we created this little fella over here, which is our CGI Panther that we um, made for uh, a trucking company uh, ad last year. Um, um, so, we'll go into a uh, little detail about various stages of production. Uh, from let's say the shoot that we did all the way to simulation and fur and rendering. Um, so a little agenda of what we'll be talking about is so first a little introduction about us and our um, company, and then we'll show the actual Panther ad. Um, we'll go into the production, the actual shoot, the V-Ray and X material that we used uh, for the first time when we did this project, and then go into simulation of muscles and dynamics that uh, fun stuff. Um, so I'm uh, Boy Fredericks. I'm head of VFX here at Post Office Amsterdam. And I'm a character and crowd specialist, um, mainly focusing on animals, but also different types of creatures and characters, anything that, that, that sort of comes alive. Um, and I used to work at MPC as VFX supervisor um, um, on the, uh, in the advertising department over there. I did, did some great commercials there. And then uh, last year I came back to Amsterdam to, uh, yeah, to join post office. All right, uh, I'll introduce myself too. My name is uh, Richie Batimena. I am here a uh, VFX uh, generalist, uh, also uh, focusing on character simulations and uh, also uh, a lot of other dynamic uh, effects for our commercials mostly. And I'll take you now to a little introduction of post office Amsterdam. So Post Office Amsterdam is a uh, post-production company based in Amsterdam since 1986 already. Um, it started as, uh, F, uh, off as an uh, editing company and later on also took on uh, the VFX side of the commercials, uh, color grading, uh, sound design, uh, music composing and voice casting. That's what we are doing also right now. So uh, yeah, basically it's like a one-stop shop for uh, all the uh, commercial agencies here in Amsterdam, uh, yeah, Netherlands, and also Europe. So what we do uh, at the moment, we are mostly focusing on uh, one at um, the characters, CG characters, uh, a lot of furry characters, as you see right here, um, like pandas, cows, cool, uh, this is macaque, monkey, 
and dogs. Dolphins, uh, also uh, more stylized creatures for ads and robots, and also uh, a lot of crowds. This is uh, a slide from our uh, in-house generated crowd uh, tool. You can have a look at it on our site. So with a stadium builder. And here's some slides from uh, our alpaca and a blue hair on. Um, so this was more slides of the bee and cool close up of our monkey. <laughs> so boy. Yeah, yeah, this 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 is a reptile that we that we made and a uh, panda. And these two last two we made with like with legendary director Sven Super. He's like the, the expert in Europe when it comes to directing CG animal ads. Um, so that's that's the person we really like to work with. Um, but today we're gonna be talking about um, less happy images and more dark, our, our Black Panther ad. Um, so let's first uh, view the ad and then uh, then we'll go into the production. So we can play it. Okay. Okay, so let's get into uh, production first. Uh, we shot this ad in uh, Quarry in Eastern Germany. Um, it's this big site where they were actually still hauling rocks um, from, the, from the quarry every day. Um, and we were there with these three big trucks. Uh, but of course, because we were driving around all the time, it's really hard to uh, light these shots. So we had a couple of balloons hanging in the air just to get some general sort of moonlight. And then we had drones flying around with actual key lights and there were drones for filming as well. And then we had this Russian arm camera rig that we, uh, that's like, that's like a, a crane on a car that we can make these awesome uh, shots while driving. Um, so you see sort of how, how these shots uh, came into play. And then of course we had this Toy Panther on set and our, our gray balls. To see, we always have the have every animal shoot we do. We try to bring a furry toy so we can actually see how the light reacts to a certain type of fur and color of fur and all the the shape that the panther has. So that when we're in lighting lighting in our in CG packages, we can sort of match the actual look on set. And then, of course, on the top right, you see we have the standard uh, gray and chrome balls that I think everyone's uh, familiar with. And here you see on the left, you see these big balloons that were just giving the general light and then the light drone going up. Um, so we had many um, drone operators working, working together on there, all on radios um, to work on this big site, which was uh, more than 100 meters wide and 300 meters long. Um, so it was quite tricky at times but a really, really cool environment to shoot something. And then like if, you're, if your plates look awesome, you're already halfway there. Um, and so what we also did was um, create a scan of the quarry using these drones. Uh, we flew around during daytime, flew around the whole quarry, taking hundreds of pictures and combining these with pictures we took from our handheld um, Canon 7D cameras. And then we, oops, let's see. So we tossed those all into Reality Capture, which is our photogrammetry software of choice. And um, so we had actually the full quarry in, um, in 3D, fully textured. So whichever shots we couldn't um, actually film for real, we could uh, then digitally create. So here's one of the shots that um, were so close up to the panther and to the action 
and that this is a shot that we just couldn't film for real on these on these high speeds. It was too dangerous to get an Alexa camera so low to the ground. Um, plus, it's really hard to see when you have to pan because you'll be shooting an empty plate. So for this one, we used uh, the scan to just create the, the whole scene digitally. Um, just a little example of some of the blend shapes we made for this character. We tried to get like a lot of skin sliding going on with all the all the shapes that we did. So when you combine them, you just see a lot of a lot of deformations happening in the in the face. Um, because they, um, yeah, of course, there's also a layer of fur on there and fat, and they're like humans, so you have to be quite subtle with your animation. So that's why we wanted just a lot of stuff to be happening. So you see all these little hairs just sort of moving, and you get a little bit of parallax with every everything he does. And then uh, for the fur, we um, we went for Yeti, which has been the, the, our software of choice for a couple of years now to do fur. It's a really great piece of software to do, especially short fur, we think. For long fur, we sometimes choose different uh, solutions. But for short fur, it's really handy because it's also uh, node-based. Um, so you can have sort of an undestructive um, way of working where you can test out different types of grooms and even reuse grooms for, for later on. So let's say if we had to do a tiger um, next or something with similar type of fur and similar scale, you could sort of reuse big chunks of it because it's, um, it's just a node-based workflow to just pipe in a different character at the beginning. You can uh, reuse a lot. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the texturing. Um, so this is how we used to do our texturing, as you can see with sort of a panda or a dog or a squirrel. This is it's sort of where you actually get um, color maps, um, just photographs of animals, and you just project them onto your, your character using Mari or Mudbox or Photoshop, whatever. Um, so this works great because you get a lot of things for free because you're just projecting real, real images on it. But also, oftentimes you get sort of, you know, because you're using pictures, you get some light bleed in there or there's maybe JPEG compression in the image that you're, that you're using to project onto it. So you can get some, sometimes some strange colors that really actually cannot exist in real life. Um, which is then very hard to get get out of your um, out of your texture map. Um, so that's why for this panther was the first time that we switched to the V-Ray Hynex material. Um, and the great thing we we liked about this shader is that we could do our texturing based on on melanin. And melanin is like an actual pigment that's in in everyone's skin or hair or eyes. And it's actually a pigment that, that controls the color of your um, yeah, of skin, skin and hair. So the more melanin you have, uh, the darker your, hairs, your hair, your skin gets. Um, so it's actually, you can control, control it with a black and white value. And if it's in, in 0.5, it gets sort of a yellowy color. Um, and so we thought this is a great, uh, would be a great project to test it out on. Because even though a black panther looks all black, um, actually, if you really look closely, it still has a little bit of pattern, like a really subtle pattern that comes out in certain uh, lighting conditions. Um, so here's a little example of how we, we, we go about these things. Um, on the left, you see a picture of a real jaguar. Um, so we, we um, photo map this on our model using um, Mari Mudbox. Whatever, and then we would make it black and white. Um, but so you see now that actually the, the black parts on the real panther, on the real jaguar, are also black in the texture. But we need to invert this because actually we need a value of one where we want it to be black. Like a, one melanin is black, so we need sort of to invert this texture. We get this bit weird looking thing on the right, but that's that's what we want because then the the melanin will get push through the shader correctly. Um, so this is our Maya, simple setup of the Maya shader where we get a pattern on the left and then the shader on the right. And in between that is a remap. So we can actually dial in the amount of melanin we, we want. So here it's just pretty basic black and white. So you, get, you would get a black and white panther as you see here on the, on the left. Um, but then by remapping the values, you can actually, um, so in the middle one, you see we, 
changed the, um, the we remapped the, the min, so output min to 0.35. And that's, um, so we up the melanin a bit and then then you get sort of a, a yellowy a yellowy color, which is sort of what an actual um, Jaguar would get. And it would react to light the same way um, a real fur would react. And then as you see on the right one, I, I think it's gonna be hard to see with zoom compression, um, but actually within the black fur, there is a very soft, you can see we put the output into like 0.85. There's a very soft, um, pattern in there still that when sometimes the light hits it, you get sort of this reddish um, panther look, uh, panther spots, um, which is what we found out when we did research that, that some, sometimes when light hits it, you see a very faint pattern. Um, so that's sort of the fun details that we, um, that we like to get into. Um, here you see it a little bit on the, on the right side of his head where a lot of light comes. Hope you guys can see it. There's a little bit of a pattern going on. Um, also, um, the shader was a big upgrade compared to the last one when it came to uh, the specular reflections. And with a big black panther like this, it's all about the specular reflections. So we got a lot of uh, nice depth in there. And that's actually what we sort of tweaked the most because there's not much color to play with. So it's all about getting that nice specular specular roll off uh, on the fur. And then um, of course for the eyes, because we knew we had we had these big close-ups in the in the film, um, we went really deep in the eyes to make sure they have a lot of depth. So we tried to get as anatomically correct as possible, creating eyes with like deep refractions and reflections going on. Um, so I'll give it up to Richie now. Yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, and now I'm going to, to uh, give a short overview of the way we uh, handle the dynamic elements in this uh, commercial, meaning uh, the muscles of the panther and creating the uh, interacting elements of the environment, like sand or, or dust or pieces of rock that uh, get uh, kicked up uh, by, by the panther. So uh, yeah, I'll start off with uh, the muscles. So to create this photoreal uh, creature, we needed to simulate uh, the muscles of the panther. And at the moment, we saw that uh, Zifa Dynamics brought this uh, great plugin for Maya, which we used. And uh, with this um, plugin, uh, you were able to generate and simulate skin and underlying tissue that dries the skin. And in the end of this process, uh, a walking um, or running panther would have the skin that behaves in a really natural way. So this is uh, a setup, two stage setup already. So in order to uh, get this set up, you need uh, in total a five-step simulation workflow to simulate uh, different parts of the body uh, um, and how it uh, responds to each other. And then the, uh, the input, which you start with, is uh, the 3D animation. The 3D animation coming uh, in our uh, case from Maya. Uh, it is the movement of the panther on a low-poly model with a rig and Maya joints. And these joints are uh, connected to uh, Ziva bones. And the uh, Ziva bones are uh, actual uh, geometry calculated for uh, collision. And then you have, uh, then you would have Ziva bones connected to Ziva muscles. And the uh, Ziva muscles are also exported as geometry also for the calculation, uh, calculation of the collision. And then again, the Ziva muscles are also exported to uh, Ziva fat. That's like a top layer or almost top layer. And uh, then that Ziva fat is also uh, exported uh, to the uh, scene where the Ziva skin is. And that Ziva skin is then on top of the fat. So you have another layer of uh, simulation. And then the actual output is uh, the alembic file of the skin. And that skin gets imported into uh, our render scene with um, also the fur boy I was uh, talking about. And uh, that was then sent our, to uh, our uh, render manager. That uh, was a uh, whole render. Uh, so yeah, first I created this, uh, yeah, like the perfect uh, muscle setup uh, fitted for our Panther model. And uh, the rig and connected the bones with the muscles to the Ziva plugin. And of course, nothing goes right the first time. So yeah, we, we also had simulations where the Panther was running and then the flesh and the muscles were flapping behind him. And yeah, yeah, it was really fun to see uh, all this uh, yeah, simulations that go wrong. But eventually everything stayed nice, uh, nice uh, in its place and uh, yeah, behaved properly. So, but now the, yeah, the tricky part was to get uh, all these shots with different animation 
uh, to have muscle sims uh, with a, yeah, the least amount of uh, manual effort for all the shots. You have all those steps of, of, of simulation. So one uh, of our, our, um, our program guys uh, created this tool um, where the input is just uh, the Maya animation and um, starting with the controllers from the rig. And then that gets pushed through all the stages of, of simulation, uh, where in the end, yeah, you would receive just one Alembic file uh, of the Panther skin, uh, and it's just ready to be rendered. So I have uh, one uh, schematic overview of that. Uh, yeah, here you would see um, just uh, at, at the first stage, you would see the animation scene. That's just the manual input. And then every scene is just one uh, part and that our uh, renderer, um, model renderer is just overviewing. And uh, you, at the end, you would just give a message. Uh, it would just give a message that it's done. But also, yeah, sometimes there were error messages, and you could see really clear where it, it would go wrong. And yeah, then we have to do it over again. But uh, yeah, that was uh, it was a nice workflow, and eventually, uh, yeah, it uh, worked out really no nice, saving a lot of time. So that was uh, also really important. So that was it for our muscle team setup. And uh, next is the simulation of the dynamic elements. Um, yeah, it is at, we uh, also see the panther running in this quarry where, yeah, you had uh, a lot of interaction with dust and uh, debris and yeah, with the ground. So this simulation was done uh, using um, Houdini, but also smoke plates in, in Nuke. But uh, for the dust, yeah, Houdini was nice uh, to, to use because yeah, you could create this setup and um, yeah, replicate it and then uh, simultaneously um, yeah, simulate it and also render it uh, in uh, Houdini, but also using a uh, V-Ray uh, for Houdini for uh, uh, rendering it. Uh, let's see. So I, in the simulation, I had this uh, cache coming from, uh, from Maya and it would get pushed through all the simulation steps. And I'll show you, let's see. This is one of the early tests, but also nice for the overview. Um, yeah, I would have like uh, first the uh, pass emitting particles from the interaction with the pass, uh, pass of particles, just fine particles, uh, thicker particles, also particles for uh, instancing little pieces of rock and dust, and then a separate pass of dust coming from the particles and from the instant pieces. So yeah, a lot of a lot of pass, but uh, really nice. Uh, when it's all layered on top of each other. And uh, I think one of the shots has also uh, like a, a grain pass when the, the panther is slowing down and uh, putting his pass in the sand. Uh, oh yeah, so once I had that, I took, just took the whole Houdini tree and branched it off, duplicated for uh, other shots and did some tweaks to just make it right for that specific shot or that specific movement. And yeah, once we had all the simulations, uh, we'd kick it out uh, to uh, V-Ray for Houdini. And at the moment also V-Ray uh, brought out that um, the volume grid shader. And yeah, that's a really nice uh, specific uh, the characteristic. And all the, yeah, the particles were just with the, the V-Ray shader for uh, Houdini. Um, let's see, and here we have some plates. Sorry, the dust with a simulation top. And of course, uh, the final grade on top of it. And I think that's it for the simulation part. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. That's it for everything. Yeah. That's 20 minutes. 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank you uh, for, for, the, uh, for listening. And I hope it was interesting. If you have any more, more questions about anything, you can always send us an email or check out the, the website for more making of and that sort of stuff. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That was fantastic. Amazing <laughs> work. Amazing work. Seriously. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, that was absolutely great. Yes, I how, if you don't mind me asking, how big was the team in this project? The team was uh, five CG artists and three compositors. Okay. So it looks like a lot of work, but I'm really pleased with quality, seriously. It was a lot of work, yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looks like it. It's also uh, nice to come up with uh, ways uh, we can uh, yeah, automate uh, as much as possible and uh, reuse stuff. So that's it's also like a really creative uh, challenge on the technical side. So, uh, yeah. Exactly.
Well, it, you nailed it, seriously. I'm very impressed. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I'm just looking at the chat right now, and I prompted people to ask Boy and Richie some questions, but the okay. questions seem... Yeah, people ask if you're using Maya or Blender. What exactly? I, I think, yeah, you Maya said that you're using Maya. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think people are still shy. Guys, don't be shy. Ask questions. Don't be shy. Send us the question back. <laughs> yes. This is the last show. You know, we have to make absolutely, it special. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be interactive. You know. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask one more question then. Any challenges you'd like to mention in this project? Because it looks very challenging for me, from my perspective. Something specific that you want, it took you longer than expected? Well, the main thing I think was the, the muscle, the muscle setup. The muscle stimulation. Uh, yeah, because there's so many manual stages that you actually have to go through and we had more than 20 shots. Um, oh, yeah. Like Richie said, there's about five stages of simulation. So to get that all automated and working on the farm, that took, yeah, that, that just took. Uh, yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. It looks like science to me, so. Yeah. Yeah. That sometimes <laughs> it's also just like like a gamble or would you go for the manual setup and just go for it or just take your time and do how to think of how to add, automate it so that's like uh, yeah gamble and then yeah we, we took the, the right choice i think yeah. yeah exactly well congrats guys it was amazing um okay if there's no other questions we can... there's one, one more there's, there's one, one more, more. Let's go the for final one yes so thomas one. horsley asked if you tried to do the muscle simulation in Houdini, you, you uh, said Jiva, but yeah, well, was Siva. Yeah, we, we looked at Houdini at, at that time, but uh, yeah, for us, Siva was at that moment was the right uh, right choice. So uh, yeah. there, there's one one shot um, where he's uh, jumping onto the car, in which we actually first uh, simulated with Siva muscles and skin, and then on top of that, um, loaded up the already simulated skin. Alembic and uh, load, uh, use that in Houdini to do some extra extra skin jiggle. So like, uh, so we made uh, vellum cloth out of it, and then um, just at certain places added some extra jiggle because we thought that that shot was was yeah it's very impactful and needed just a little bit of extra jiggle. Um, so we did that in in Houdini. Yeah. So, and we we often use Houdini for other characters that are a bit simpler that we don't want to do a full muscle setup for. We just want to you know, run through vellum a bit and, and make it jiggle. Um, so that's that's when we use Houdini. When there's a bit, yeah, less time and uh, less budget and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, guys. Really great. Okay. okay. Uh, we're a bit ahead of time. So I suggest we jump on to the next part of our show, which is the interview with Vlado. Hi, Vlado. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. <laughs> we, we know you're quite busy, so we really appreciate the time that you are giving us today. And Andra, same goes for you too. Not that the rest of you guys are not busy, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, right. So normally we would have this conversation with you, this interview in the office where I'm at. But the world has changed quite a bit since um, the beginning of this year. So how's been working for, from home for you so far? Um, it's been actually pretty okay, although it gets a little bit boring and repetitive after a while. Um, because um, obviously we, we talk with colleagues over uh, chat and everything. We have the online uh, video meetings, but it's just not the same as talking to people in person and just meeting people in the office, kind of in the corridor when you go to make a cup of coffee or something and you meet people and you say hi and stuff like that. I really started to miss this because I actually started forgetting what people look like. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of a frightening thought. So um, it's been okay work wise. We actually um, managed to uh, get uh, like the work is going on nicely. We managed to do the releases that we plan to do on time and everything. So there is no problem with uh, the actual work process. We got used to working remotely, uh, logging on to the workstations at the office and so on. So that part worked fine, but just this other social part kind of fell apart. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. That's why I'm back. Because <laughs> I really missed having some people around. 
Um, nice. And so this year, it's it's a big year for, for us here at Chaos because uh, we launched VRA5. Uh, we're working on Project Lavina. There's also the Personal Learning Edition for Maya, which we released. And uh, me and Nikos, we were just wondering which of these projects is your favorite one and the one that you're most excited about? So I don't have a, a, a favorite project because I like all of them, um, obviously. And I work on V-Ray. So in terms of a favorite project, V-Ray is still my favorite one because I, I know it so well. And I still do stuff in V-Ray from time to time. I really enjoy that. But the project that's really exciting for me this year is uh, Lavina, uh, mostly because it's a little different from everything else that we're doing uh, in terms of like V-Ray is generally a plugin for something else. So we have V-Ray for 3ds Max, V-Ray for Maya, uh, Houdini, and so on. And you always have another application that you have to sort of um, take into account. And um, they have their own APIs and their own little uh, I do sync crashes or I don't know how, like peculiarities. Um, so it was nice to work on our own application for a while because Lavina is a standalone application. So um, I'm really excited to see how that will turn out. Obviously the UI in V-Ray is really simple. The, the frame buffer is the, the biggest uh, UI task that we've, we've done, but Lavina is a whole application. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Nikos, do you want to jump in with a question? Yeah, I will actually, I remember last year, um, I saw Ornitra presenting this amazing research on caustics they did. And I think you mentioned you guys thinking to implement it on V-Ray. Is it still happening? Do you know? Because I saw some questions for people asking about caustics, and I'm asking as well, to be honest. Is it something you guys seen your thing to continue the research oh. in the caustics? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, so this year, right before the, the COVID, Thing happened in February. We had a um, sort of like a hackathon thingy with um, the guys from Chaos Check. So a, a bunch of developers from uh, Sofia uh, went to to Prague for uh, a week, um, and uh, basically they we paired um, developers from Veer and Corona, and they worked on various uh, problems. So Caustics was one of these problems. Um, Obviously, we in three days you, you can't really do much, but at least we got familiar with the way the caustics are done in Corona. So um, now, when we got back, we've had a little bit of time uh, for our developer to uh, start looking into this more seriously. So um, we actually have a version of um, the caustics method that um, is implemented uh, in Corona. So this is kind of working in V-Ray. Um, it's not exactly the, the same approach. Obviously, the render engines are slightly different, but uh, there is some work going on. So um, it will come out in one of the um, V-Ray 5 updates. Exciting news. Thanks for that. No problem. And you mentioned challenges and having a hackathon resolving challenges. And we know that most of your time you spend actually resolving pretty complex technical problems. And um, what's, what are you doing right now? Like <laughs> what's puzzling you? What doesn't let you sleep at night? What are you working on? Um, so very thankfully we have um, a number of great developers, um, both in the Prague office and in the Sofia office. So I don't have to solve uh, that many difficult technical problems myself. Um, but I still work on stuff. So the most recent thing that I did was um, for actually for VA for SketchUp. Um, there was a there is some little specific way of how UV coordinates are exported from uh, SketchUp, and uh, I needed to add um, some tweaks to VA so that we can support uh, this way of exporting UVs uh, a little better. Um, it's been causing problems for our developers for a while now, so I thought that I should probably uh, take a look at that and try to make it a little bit more optimized. Awesome. I have another question. I know that we, we just launched the CD competition and we have many students watching and inspiring artists. 
maybe you can give them an advice, something, you know, if you go back to college these days, you know, what do you think would be the best for you to do? Like any advice for them? Um, so <laughs> that's uh, always a difficult one. So about that. <laughs> obviously, if you want to be successful at anything, the, the key is to not give up and work on a problem until um, you find a solution. So that's number one. Um, and it helps if the problem is interesting. And uh, obviously, because rendering was interesting for me, I kept working on it until I got stuff done. But actually, one of the biggest advice I would say is make backups of everything. Uh, because uh, actually, when I when I was a student at Sofia University, I started coding this uh, demo thing. Like, you know, there is these little graphic demos that uh, show some kind of cool uh, 3D animation or something uh, for um, three or four minutes. So I started writing this, and I got to a point it looked really nice and everything, and then my hard drive crashed, and I lost everything. Um, so yeah, that's a piece of advice. And, I think uh, it's a great advice. It happened to me in the past, and I learned my lesson. So <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lesson all of us learned the hard way, I guess. <laughs> Okay, and I see we have some questions about V-Ray for Blender. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? What was the plan there? Um, right. Um, so, as you know, um, a few years ago, Andre, who is the original developer of V-Ray for Blender, um, started working for us um, here in Sofia. Um, so he worked on Blender for a bit. Um, he got uh, another developer to join him. They worked on uh, improving the um, way Vue is integrated into Blender so that we could get IPR working. So that kind of reached some point. Um, and we thought that we should uh, leave it for a bit and maybe come to it uh, later because we wanted to look into Vue for Houdini. So, um, that kind of took off, especially recently, and uh, our small regional team was busy uh, supporting customers and developing stuff for them um, in Houdini. So um, we didn't really have anyone looking into Blender for a while. Um, and um, then um, obviously uh, Blender 2.8 came out. So we decided to go back to the project and see whether we can release a new version. But the problem was we found that Blender had changed quite a bit between uh, the 2.7 version and the 2.8 version. There were too many changes. <clears throat> Some of those changes were very similar to uh, things that we had done to get Vue for Blender working. So there were a lot of conflicts and uh, this made the task really difficult. Also, as you know, because of the GPL uh, license of Blender, it's integration is not as straightforward as it is for other applications. So it makes the whole thing a little bit more complicated. And the guy that originally started looking to it, um, he's a very smart uh, developer, but it turned out that he's a little bit too inexperienced to handle this level of complexity. So he, he tried really hard, but um, eventually we decided that uh, we should maybe try a different approach. And um, I asked another uh, senior developer to uh, look into that. So um, this, is, this has been going on uh, for the last few months and it seems to be going pretty well. Um, I'm actually hoping that uh, we will have some results soon. There is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel right now. So um, we are working on it. We haven't given up. Uh, it just took way longer than uh, I expected. Um, I know also that, and maybe Andre can uh, mention this a bit later on, that there is some community effort for a version of Corona for Blender, but um, I'm yeah. not sure whether uh, anything official will come out of it. There were some limitations in Corona for a long time that uh, there was a ex uh, community exporter, but there was only so far that it could be pushed because of some limitations. and basically spent uh, half a year removing these limitations. So now uh, this can resume. So we will try to get into the contact with the two people that did the exporters originally and see if they are still interested in working on it and uh, if, if they can start developing it past the original uh, problems.
Okay. And from the hot topic of Blender to the hot topic of Cinema 4D. Uh, but before I ask you this question, guys in the production team, can we please run the video for VRA for Cinema 4D? Thank you. Yeah, so we are soon giving access people to um, the VRA for Cinema 4D beta, but I, because I'm replying to user comments every day, and I know that the the community of VRA for Cinema 4D users has been waiting patiently for a long time for this. Um, can you please tell us what is the most exciting thing that they will find and why they should bear with us a little bit more? Well, um, I guess the most exciting thing is that it will be based on the latest uh, V-Ray, V-Ray 5. So it will have things like the new frame buffer, um, all the speed improvements that we've done in V-Ray. Uh, it will have V-Ray GPU, um, very good uh, interactive rendering. Um, and overall, I think it will be a, a great product. Um, as you know, we when we originally um, decided to bring uh, Vray for Cinema 4D um, for development inside Chaos, we we looked at the source code, so we had to decide whether we wanted to continue with the old uh, code or start from scratch. Um, and we felt that if we really wanted to give users the best experience, uh, we should start from scratch. And I guess this is because when V8 for Cinema 4D started originally, um, I think it was one of our very, very first integrations of VRA into another product. The SDK was actually not very mature back then, so you had to do some kind of hacks to get stuff working. Um, and it worked very well up to a point, but it didn't very well work for interactive rendering, for example. So um, we decided that instead of continuing uh, with uh, that, uh, approach. We should start from scratch using um, all the improvements that we've, we've done to the VRA API over the years so that we can um, get the best performance and the, and the best uh, user experience. So I think people will really notice the difference when they get their hands on it. Um, obviously, there's the challenge of supporting everything because the renderer has so many features. There are materials, textures, lights, uh, proxy objects, different geometry objects. So it takes a, a while to um, rewrite all of that. It's not an easy process. Uh, from my experience, it takes about two years to write a new VRA integration from scratch for another modeling application. So for VRA for Cinema 4D, that was also true. We started almost exactly two years ago. Um, but um, I think people will really like the results. And even if some little stuff is missing here and there, we will be adding there will be updates and we'll be adding uh, more stuff. That's great. Nikus, any final questions? Or... I think we're good. I don't know if we have something from the audience. I think we're running a little bit late with the timing, so maybe uh, okay. we can wrap up. Thank you so much, Vlado. I think no this, was, Thank you, Vlado. this was a great update and people were, were asking about these things, so it's it's great that we use this platform to actually give them some yep. answers. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Um, great. Then, ta-da, Nikos, it's your turn. <laughs> so I told you, I told you guys, Nikos is the master of light. So now he will actually show you that he's the master of light mix.
Oh my God, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I am guess I have to share my screen. Yes. Great. So, just gonna make it full screen. Can you all see? Yes. Okay, great. So yes, uh, my name is Nikos Nikolopoulos and I'm the founder of Creative Lighting and I'm very passionate about light. I spent many years studying and analyzing create and film and cinema and creative techniques that I can light my scenes. And after that study, I created the, the, the developed the creative lighting philosophy. It's an inspirational approach to lighting in CDI for architects, designers, and visualizers. And we launched the brand in 2015 at Cityscape in London. And so far it's been a great journey, guys. And I'm really enjoying If you want to learn from us, please visit the website because today I'm actually here to talk about the power of light mix in VD5 and Corona 6 and how it helps designers to visualize architecture. Chaos Group contacted me a couple of months ago in VD5 Beta and asked me to make an article for Art Daily and explain the power of light mix, simple as that. Uh, actually, it was Lon Gross that contacted me, so thank Lon and the rest of the team. And I developed an original idea for them to demonstrate, of course, our philosophy and how it can be perfectly combined with light mix. So this is the mood board that I create to tell my story. The idea, it's actually, it's called The Writer House. It's an idea about a writer that he loves to write amazing stories in the forest. He's inspired by nature. He loves design. And he also likes horses and lighting. That's his passion. So the mood board sets the visual expression of a vision and the vision is your desire to communicate something. I'm always starting with the mood board. As, as I'm always saying in my classes, the idea starts in your mind and then you need to look for references to develop the idea further. So this is the idea, guys. Now we have to make the scene and celebrate the design, the view, and the light. So this is the stage design. This is the scene. This is the composition of the space. As you can see, we have the main element. He loves this beautiful design from Wii the horse lamp, and I'm using the golden spider to direct the viewer from one corner all the way into, the, into here. So that was my winner composition. As you can see, design and the view is also an important element, but when I'm designing and I'm making compositions, I'm always thinking more guides. I'm not gonna say rules, I'm just gonna say guides. So as you can see, this is my number one choice, but when I have to add extra elements into the image, like the telescope and the plant, I'm using the rule of thirds and I'm aligning this object in the vertical lines, okay? So always think how you can make your composition more powerful. The main purpose of composition is to add balance, shape, and form into the image. And if you go further, there is more. You see now I'm aligning the desk where the writer is gonna be with a center composition. When it comes to center composition, Stanley Kubrick is a great master and I followed him for many years. So three different guides in one image. Yes, why not? If it's possible, do it, guys. It's gonna make your image even more powerful. So this is the composition stage. And then I collaborate with the lighting designer, Katya Kolovea, the, the, um, the founder of Archipos. And together we start talking about what elements can we add to make this image more powerful lighting-wise? Because to demonstrate the power of light mix, you need light, right? So this is all the different light fixtures that we decide to add. Katya did this mood board. It's an amazing mood board. I really like it. You can see here the spotlights, the practical lights. When we say practical lights, it's the light that is visible in the camera, in the scene. You can see the research about the lighting of the stair, the grazing, amazing technique to highlight the surfaces, wall mounted ambient light without, without, without seeing the source, that's amazing. And you can also see the research about the IES that we're gonna use. So this is the technical mood board, the lighting feature. Now you have to bring this into the scene. It's time to sketch your ideas. You know, the idea is to bring all these elements to life and then use the power of light mix to make the cement. As you can see here, this is the grazing light, the wall mounted, the horse lamp, all these beautiful decorative lights that you can see here visible in the camera, the spotlights. So sketch your ideas, decide where everything is going, and then try to create the image with light mix. So I would like to say thanks to Katya for this collaboration. I, I did learn a lot working with her, and I cannot wait for our next project together. So now when you have all this combined, 
With light mixing VRA5, you can actually create the cement. You can see the writer inspired. He loves to be in nature. He loves to be in the woods with beautiful volumetrics happening in the background. And then you have the light and the story. Here is my color palette. As you can see, I'm using the light mix. And the idea now is to go further and use the light mix to make different light moods and also tell different stories with one single render. Again, I would like to mention something else. I want you to see my invisible highlights. For example, I have highlight in the telescope, highlight in this plant, highlight on him, highlight here. As I always say, the image, the space needs depth and the image needs focus and hierarchy. And that's why I'm using the power of light to direct the viewer what I want. And as you can see, the golden spiral, everything that goes around the spiral, there is a light or a highlight to celebrate the design and the concept. So guys, let's use the light mix and I'm gonna go next and I'm gonna change the mood. I want you to pay attention into my color palette, intensity and color, okay? As you can see now, the environment is taking over. There's no artificial lighting. The moonlight is lighting the scene. I'm using the skylight, the background and the direct light to create the mood. That's why I love lighting. All I have to do is change the intensity and the color and turn some lights on and off. Let's go and do this again. And now a different story. Now we have more artificial lighting. This is the creative time for the writer to develop the story and write the story. It's his creative time. The artificial lighting, it's super warm compared to the cold environment. And all this time I'm using Kelvin. Like here, I'm using very warm Kelvin, like 3.5, let's say 300, 500, um, around there. And you can see it here. So, so far, I'm not using RGB. I'm just using Kelvin in temperature. Let's do this again. Another lighting move. Again, one render, multiple compositions. This is the wine time. This is after writing. He's relaxing, enjoying the moment, enjoying the view. And maybe he start thinking about the next project or the next thing he's going to write. And now, as you can see, the grazing effect, it does make a big difference. The horse lamp, it's lower the intensity, different mood, cold in here. It's all about playing with color and intensity. But always, guys, my advice, have an idea in your mind. Always, you know, every image has a message. I want you to be clear. Where are you going before you start making? That's why you have the mood board. And that's why you have your ideas and your stories. I, I never spend time inside the software. I spend time before, organize my thoughts, my ideas, and then I'm start playing around. Now, this is lighting modes with keeping them, working with Kelvins. Now let's go a bit further away. As you know, my passion is cinematic, theater. Let's start making cinematic modes and get inspired by cinema. As I said before, I study in many years before I developed the creative lighting philosophy. And now we're going to get inspired by La, La Land. And as you can see here, this is my reference. You know, when I see a film and it inspires me, I want to go back and I want to learn. I want to get inspired. And now I'm going to take this palette into the image. The secret ingredient is to find out which color can go where into the scene, right? As you can see here, I have this blue environment going straight into the background. The highlight. I decided to highlight the stair with the cyan and the pink, you need to go on the floor. And then simple as that, you have the color palette into the image. So always try to get inspired by nature, by cinema, by theater, anything. That's what storytelling is about. And thanks God now with VRA5 and light mix, all this can happen, one single render. A different film, a different story, a different mood. Now I'm using Parasite and I'm getting the blue environment back into the sky. I'm getting the green into the floor and the orange back into the stair. I'm not a big fan of green, but you know what? I like this image. I like this color palette that we created with a single render. And I'm gonna do this one more time and I'm gonna show you my favorite image because I really like red. Red is definitely my color or purple. And I'm gonna show you this color palette. And this is Stanley Kubrick again. He's a great master. Center composition. Always have masters that you like and follow them to get inspired and learn from them. 
I'm still doing it every day in my life. And as you can see here, now the cyan, it goes straight into the background. It's bright, it's highlighting the stir. And at the same time, the strong red and very saturated red, it goes into the floor. So this is what Tore Gallery is about. And this is what, why I'm calling this class the power of light mix. I would like to say a big thank you again for Chaos Group for this opportunity to write an article about this because first I have to try the beta and I learned so much by trying the beta. I enjoy the beta and now it's out and I can use it all day in my work. The next thing I want to do is do the same thing with Corona. I know we have Vlado and Ondra. I want to, them to be both happy that I'm doing this class for them, this live demonstration. So let's do the same thing and this time we're going to use Corona. Oh, before we do, I have two more images, to be honest. As you can see, sorry about that. As you can see, it's up to you guys. Where do you want to take the story? Where the writer is making this beautiful story? It's up to you to decide the background or the story. Light mix is there. It's up to you to light your imaginations, decide where you want to go, and light mix is gonna do it for you because it's an amazing tool that you now have. And this is more commercial. It's less cinematic, but still very powerful. I really like the image. And if you like imagination games, here you are. Now you might say, oh, now the top floor is getting more interesting because now you have the telescope and you can connect with the stars. And now you can also see what I mean about highlights. Again, the space needs depth, the image needs hierarchy, highlight and focus. This is what I believe, and that's how I'm making images. If you want to give me some tips as well about light mix, I'm going to say four things. First, of course, save the light mix so you can load it back at any time. Use white in the scene so you can color in the light mix from the light mix, always white into the scene. Name your lights. If you don't name your lights, you're going to end up with 10 slides and you don't know what you're doing. You're losing production time. Always name your lights. And my last advice, be careful with the intensity. As you can see, my numbers, they're very sensitive. I'm not going too high or too low. Keep the intensity medium in the scene, nothing too bright or too dark, because light mix is sensitive. If you make it really bright, like 20 in the light mix, you're going to introduce noise. So keep the light where you want it in the scene and use the light mix to make small changes. For me, 0.1 and 5 is more than enough to do whatever I want. So keep this idea in your mind. Sometimes my client says, Nikos, why I have noise in the light mix? Oh, wait, your light mix, you have 25 value. Please update the file in the scene and use less value in the light mix. This is quick tips, guys, just to give, to give you going how you can use light mix creatively. And as I promised, I have one more story and hopefully I'm going to finish on time. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Scene cannot change reality. Let us change the eyes with see reality. This is a quote from Nikos Kazadakis a Greek writer, and since this is the writer house, I thought it would be great to bring this amazing writer in this game. I love this quote, it's very inspiring. Okay, so, one day project. Um, during lockdown, I realized that I'm spending more time cruising what's happening in Instagram in the morning and Facebook, and I realized that was wrong. Um, even if it's the, the world is having a tough time. In the same time, you guys and me as well, we have to stay creative. So I developed this concept, one day project, and I'm start doing one day projects to keep me creative. You know, the idea is that I'm not going to start by looking what other people are making. I'm going to start by making. You know, that's that's the message I want to give you. So I start this project. This is one of them, and the idea was I want I'm going to travel in three different locations with lightning. You know. Keep myself busy. I miss traveling. I'm, I'm sure you miss him traveling as well. But through the light mix and corona, I'm going to go into different locations. This is the sunny view. This is my first location that I'm going to go. Beautiful sunny view. I'm Greek. I love, I, love, I love water. I love blue. This is the first view. Then I'm going to go in the lake to see these beautiful swans, very foggy, more dramatic, but still very interesting to me. And lastly, I'm going to go in, the, in Norway to see the northern lights. So one light which finds three amazing trips, right? And this is my scene. I'm starting with center composition. Again, I'm always getting inspired by Stanley Kubrick. And here we have the story. 
it's this beautiful guy and the late and the, and the kid and they're playing imagination games you know he's trying to tell her that they're going to travel one day again and she's just trying to inspire her with a story again while i'm composing guys i'm always looking other guides and as you can see here i'm aligning everything into the red golden ratio so this is my first story this is the inside corona now Again, this is the sea view, but as I promise you, we're going to go and see two other locations with one render. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do this live, and I'm going to, this is the live machine for Anna, and I'm going to load the second location. Actually, let me show you what I have. So this is the sea view. I've been light coming into the space. This is the lake view. You can see how the colors affecting the scene. The night view, I love this color, this amazing color palette already. Just it goes so well into the scene. My skylight, my direct light. I have the gobo lighting. Oh, that's my favorite. I learned this from, cine from theater. I'm shaping the light with an image and I'm creating shadow patterns in space. I have some patterns behind me, as you can see, but this is just an image, the lamps, the people highlights, space highlights, and rest. When you combine rest with gobo, sorry, with lamp, you have the story. I always separate the highlight and the light so I can be more creative and you can build the connection later on. So when I press load, now we are inside the lake. And this is all happening with the same render, guys. You know, this is what the power of lightness is about. And you can see here why my gobo is so important. I'm trying to connect the inside world with the outside world. And the last view for today, the night. Again, look at my color palette. It's all about getting these beautiful colors into the scene, and then you have an amazing result. If I bring everything to white, there's no feeling, there's no story. If I bring everything back again, now you have an image. So that's how I'm using Lightmix. Hopefully that was a quick inspiring class for you guys. I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Lightmix is not just about changing intensity color, it's about bringing your creative ideas to life. Hopefully you enjoy the class. I would like to also mention that we're launching a brand new class of Lightmix next month, inspired by Chaos Group, because when we launched the, the, the article, many people contact us and says, Nikos, that's amazing. Can you make a class about it? And I was like, okay, why not? I love this idea. So guys, if you want to be involved, we'll have five tickets for free, 100% discount code. All you have to do is go to our website, creativelight.co slash lightweeks and use the code 24 hours of chaos. The first five people, they will get five free tickets. That's it. Yay. I try to be on time. Sorry if I was late. Um, yeah. Oh, don't be sorry about anything. We were just discussing here between us that we can listen to you all day, Nikos. Your voice oh is like a, <laughs> like a song. <laughs> I was trying to be on time. It's important. But thank you to Vlado and Ondra for making such an amazing software, guys. I believe in the power of the light mix and I believe in both of KFG products. You guys rock and roll. I just present what the software can do. Super cool. I'm so glad you like this. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, if there's any questions for me, then I'm here. Yes, let's see. If there are any questions for you? Hmm. I'll check on the chat, but in the meantime, yes. I think Vlado wanted to mention something else, and that's why he came back. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about... Uh, Oh, sorry, what was the question? Question is about uh, UST and Hydra. Exactly. Um, and um, yeah, I actually had this in my notes when I talked about uh, beer for, for Blender, but as I mentioned, um, Andre um, and his small team, they're now working on beer for Houdini. And um, the latest uh, versions of Houdini include a special um, look dev mode called Solaris, which is using uh, um, Hydra to render stuff in the viewport. And Hydra is an API that allows any modeling application to talk to any renderer that supports the Hydra API. 
And um, we have started work um, on uh, supporting Hydra for V-Ray. So, um, and this is actually um, down to uh, some initial version. Actually, the latest versions of V-Ray for Houdini already include uh, the Hydra uh, version of V-Ray. So there's still a lot of stuff to um, figure out uh, because um, some things are not uh, clear even to the side effects guys. So we're trying to uh, talk to them and uh, figure out how to get stuff working. So that is going on. And the cool thing is once we have the Hydra version of beer, we can plug it into any other application that supports Hydra. Um, and we'll see, actually it will be cool if Blender will support Hydra at some point, then any render that supports Hydra could plug into Blender right away. Uh, so that's an interesting thought. Not sure how it will work with a GPL um license of blender but it would be uh, it would be actually pretty cool um and about usd um this is another effort that we are uh, working on um obviously i'm hoping that the various dccs will support usd natively uh, like uh 3ds max and Maya will hopefully uh, implement support for usd in a similar way to how houdini um, is handling it but we know that we need to handle USD natively in VRA similar to how we do with Alembic. So this is also work that is um, going on. We have some initial results, but um, hopefully one of the uh, VRA5 updates will, uh, will include support for USD. Cool, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, great. Sonia, are you ready? I know you've prepared us an amazing shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Great. Okay. Right, should, should I see if I can share my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. please. Let's see. So the title of your talk is Making a Detour with V-Ray 5. Yes. Let me see if this works. Can you see my screen? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been absolutely incredible. Uh, I loved, like, I kind of want to, I want to create some cr uh, furry creatures now, and I want to get into light mix and uh, just play around. It's been, uh, it's been super awesome. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, but uh, let's get started. So first, I want to quickly introduce myself. So let's do that. So hi, my name is Sonia Kristoff and uh, I'm a CG generalist. I, uh, I first started off as a map painter at Rhythm and Hues before I trans transitioned more into a generalist uh, role at Industrial Light and Magic. Um, I've worked on TV, film, commercials, uh, theme park rides, VR, AAA games. Uh, interactive exhibits, <laughs> and uh, I even did a jigsaw puzzle recently. So um, a lot of different things. Uh, I like to switch things up. Um, I haven't done art biz yet, though, so that, that might be on the list. I might have to try that one of these days. Um, but anyway, today I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about V-Ray 5 and how some of the new features in V-Ray 5 have influenced my workflow. And to do that, I put together this little keyframe illustration and uh, I call it a detour. And uh, I came up with the idea for this after I went through a week of binge watching old movies. Like, you know, movies I remember watching when I grew up as a kid, uh, you know, like Back to the Future, uh, Terminator, uh, The Mask, Jaws. Oh my God, Jaws is still the reason I don't go scuba diving this uh, to this day really, um, and uh, the Iron Giant. So basically after all this time, uh, it's, I, you know, all that like full-blown nostalgia trip in a way, uh, I wanted to capture something, uh, that sense of adventure, you know, that sense of adventure and discovery, you know, not knowing what's around the corner. Uh, who knows, maybe it's a giant robot, you know, uh, all from my, uh, from my home office, of course, uh, yeah. 
we are, uh, it's 2020, it's a different time. Um, so I used a couple of uh, different software packages to create this image. Uh, I did some modeling in Blender. I created the mid and background terrain in Gaia. I also used some Quixel mega scans, uh, but ultimately Substance Designer, I used that as well. Uh, but ultimately I assembled everything together uh, in 3ds Max and I rendered it with V-Ray 5. Uh, now I know I keep talking about V-Ray 5. Let's talk about what some of those new features are. Now, these are just some of the new features. There's obviously a lot more, um, but the ones I wanna focus on today are the material manager, the texture randomizer, dirt. You'll find out a lot of my talk today is about dirt uh, and uh, a little bit of the compositing in the V-Ray frame buffer. Now we don't have a lot of time to go into like the specifics of that. So I'll just quickly show you how I applied it for one of the images uh, that you'll see in this presentation. So that's sort of, that's the plan. So first off, let's talk about what is new in the material manager. So it's essentially a brand new library of pre-made materials ready to be used in your scene. You have a ton of materials you can choose from. They all look amazing and they're just ready to be dropped in and you can hit render and you can go. Like having this library is a huge time saver. And honestly, most of the features I'm going to talk about today are exactly that, right? They're just huge time savers. And they, I mean, they will allow you to work much, much faster and much more efficiently. And if you're anything like me, and I'm sure most of you guys are, there's never enough time in the day. So if you find a tool that makes your life easier and speeds up your workflow, I, I'm in heaven, you know, it's, it's super awesome. I'm very excited. And V-Ray 5 has really done an amazing job of that. So you guys are awesome, by the way. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, it's really, really great. So anyway, uh, we also have, before I finish talking about the material manager, we also have some new options in the materials. We now have coat and sheen options. Really awesome for car paint and for fabric. So all of you car people out there. This is for you, this is awesome. You're gonna love this. Next thing, and this is one of my personal favorites, that's the texture randomizer. And this is huge. If you've ever worked with a large scale environment, you know how painful and how long it takes to break up those tileable textures. It can take forever. Not with this, this is awesome. So this is one single node, you attach it to your textures, you check, you have a couple of different options. One of them is the stochastic tiling. And I hope I pronounced that properly. Don't quote me on it, but that thing, it's amazing. And uh, basically you check that little box, you have some options and you can apply random offsets, random rotation, random scale to all to that single texture. It is absolutely amazing, saves you so much time. It's great, I'm happy. Next one, dirt. We have new V-Ray dirt and it has streaks. Now, if you don't use a lot of V-Ray dirt in your scene, a lot of AO, you should, you know, it helps everything in your scene be more grounded. Uh, it makes it look more realistic. You know, it's a very subtle change. It's a subtle thing, but it helps, you know, it just pushes your scene that much further. So big fan of this. I'm super excited. I used it pretty much on everything except for the trees. I didn't use it on the trees, but I used it on everything else. So it's really good. Uh, all right. So these are the three features I want to talk to you guys, or I don't want to focus on most today. And I figured I'd show you how I use these new features uh, to texture the robot in my scene. And I put a little video together. So this is your cue, guys. Can we see the video? All right, it works, great. So this is the robot and you've already seen it from the image. So you know, it's large, it's in the background, it's an atmosphere. It has absolutely no UV mapping on it. Absolutely none. <laughs> uh, so here we go, let's get started. First thing I do is I apply a multi-object. Uh, I figure out my materials for the scene. So I want a painted yellow metal. I want the base metal. I want a 
uh, glowy light material for the eyes. Uh, I need uh, like a metal for the voice box and I need uh, plastic for the cables. So we're gonna open up the material library and here you can see some of those materials I talked about earlier. They really look amazing, but I need a metal. So let's go back to the metal. And lucky me, there's a painted yellow, how convenient. So we're gonna use this one. This one is cool too, but I'm gonna use the other one. And let's apply it and let's get it into our scene. Let's hook it up. And let's take a quick look of what that looks like. That looks great. Uh, it has a nice little bit of a noise map in there, uh, just in the bump to break up a little bit of that spec. And honestly, that looks awesome. I don't, uh, uh, I don't think I need to do anything else to that because I know I'm going to layer this on top of a base metal that I'm going to scratch up. So that's what we're going to work on next. So we have a couple of weathered metals. I like this one here. I like how it's dark underneath. And, but I do like the, the scale of the scratches from the metal on the right. So I'm going to first bring in the first material that I liked, and then I'm going to swap out the textures for um, the other one uh, that we saw uh, on the right hand side that had the smaller scale scratches on it. So we're going to use that one instead. So let's hook up the different bitmaps. And that's our material preview, which is also brand new, by the way. It looks really nice. And this is the UVW randomizer that I talked about. And you can see there's the tiling option that I mentioned. Now, that is piped into a triplanar mapping node, which is great because, again, I have done no UVing on this whatsoever. And then that goes into all our textures. So let's see what we get right out of the box. So I'm going to hook that up and apply it to everything just so I see what, what it is doing overall. The scale on the texture is not quite right, so I'm going to go back to my triplanar node and I'm going to adjust the size on that. That's much better. So I like that. I get a nice little bit of a breakup. I think that looks good. So now I want to add some edge weathering and some edge breakup. Now for that, I use the V-Ray Dirt. And I like to pipe that into just a brand new V-Ray material uh, that I apply over everything, just because it's easier and it's faster for me to see what I'm doing and to really dial in the dirt effect. Ah, really nice AO, it looks good. And you can see we have some new, we have some new features over there on the right. And if you're not quite sure which en what any of these do, uh, or if you forgot, uh, you haven't worked with it in a while, there is a handy website, uh, or there's a handy uh, uh, link to the, on the Chaos Group uh, documentation site. It in explains everything, and it has examples. And I think we're all visual people, so examples are amazing. Uh, it's really quickly to see what a high value does, what a low value does. So. This is a great website to have uh, standing by when you're dealing with V-Ray Dirt. All right, so it's time to dial this in a little bit more. So I definitely want a stronger effect. I also want ambient and inner occlusion. I want both. I will also want some streaks. Still not strong enough. I'm gonna crank that up a little bit more. There we go. Now we add the streaks to it. We need a little bit more length on them and we also need to add a direction to them. So that's what I do here. Almost. Hi, right, cool. I think that looks pretty good. 
And I think I just uh, decided to do a full size render here just to make sure it looks exactly how I want it. And that looks good. I'm happy with that. All right. So that's my V-Ray Dirt dialed in. So now I'm going to pipe that V-Ray Dirt. I'm going to layer that on top of my uh, my scratch map that I already had. So for that, I need a composite node. So we'll drag that in. Probably have to rearrange some of this because it's getting a little crowded in there. We'll plug that in. That goes into the reflection. And then I'm going to take the V-Ray Dirt. Need a second layer for that. And we're going to set this to multiply. And let's do a uh, let's apply that to the robot first of all. See what we get. Maybe a bit strong. I'm going to kick that back a notch. Maybe to like 80%. Sounds good. We'll try that. Ah, I think that looks pretty good. All right, so now I'm going to copy that same setup, uh, that same very dirt, and I'm also going to put that into my reflection roughness. All right, and I think that's it. I think I'm happy with that. So that's actually my base metal for my robot. So next thing is I want to layer it. So I want to take this base metal that we just created. I'm going to put that into a very rare blend. And then I'm going to put the painted yellow metal on top. And then I'm going to use the scratch texture that we used here in the reflection map. I'm going to use that as my alpha. And let's take a look what that looks like. And that's a bit too overall worn for me. So that's a quick fix though. Uh, I just need a color correction and I just need to increase the contrast in that texture. So we plug that in here, open it up. Uh, I like to use the advanced settings. So I'm just going to increase the gain and lower the gamma. And that's starting to look a lot better. Yeah, that's more what I had in mind. So I think I do a I think I do, uh, yeah, I do a full size render here again as well. And I'm happy with this. It has, you know, it has a little bit of that edge breakup. I don't see any tiling sticking out to me, it has a nice little breakup in between. Um, the one thing I'm not, I don't know if you can see this on uh, the zoom screen here, but uh, there is like a one pixel uh, of white uh, just along where the paint stops and the metal, the bare metal starts. And then the bare metal is really dark. Now I actually want the opposite effect, right? I want uh, where the where the paint is worn away the most, I want that to be really, really reflective. And then as we get towards the paint, I want just a tiny bit of layer, um, just a little bit of that primer uh, that, you know, that you put on before the paint goes on top of it. So the way to do that, I just uh, inverted uh, my texture that goes in the reflection map. And you can see the effect here. It was really nice and bright and shiny. It was reflective. But without that extra little strip of primer, just that tiny little bit of edge, it feels really, really flat. So you really need that. You really need that separation just a little bit. Again, it's subtle, um, but just to hint that this is a layered material. And I am, uh, yeah, I'm happy with this. I think this looks good. I think this tells the story. So that's pretty much it for the base metal of my robot. So let's move on to the eyes. And for the eyes, I just wanted something very simple. They should be glowy. They should have a hot core and maybe like a blue cyan outer ring, something like that. So for that, I just use a V-Ray light material and I use a gradient ramp and I set that to radial. There it is. And then really after that, it just comes down to dialing in the intensity of the light material. 
uh, and the, uh, the colors and uh, the location of the slider and the gradient ramp. And that's really just a preference. It's just styling it and playing around with it until I get something that I like. That was a bit too blue. Cyan looks better. All right, cool. All right, that's done. Uh, next up, we need a, a patterned metal for that little voice box that he has. And I saw one in the library again. So let's drop that in. Let's hook that up. We'll replace our little blockout material. There we go. Let's hook that up. I'm going to delete one of these textures. I'll just use, I just need one. I pipe that both into both categories there. And then it's really just adjusting the tiling to make sure it matches the scale of the robot. So right now that's obviously way too big. Let's try something maybe like that. Eh, that's still too big. Let's try 15. Let's do a quick uh, region render. There we go. Let's try that. Yeah, I think we're getting somewhere. It's fine if it looks a little scruffy. Um, it's really just, you just want to hint that there's some detail, that there's some something else happening. Because um, again, my robot is far off in the distance. So let's see what this looks like in context. By the way, I'm using the V-Ray Denoiser. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this or not, but uh, I like to use it when I'm dialing in materials or I'm dialing in uh, a scene, um, lighting, any of those things, just because uh, I can lower my samples and I can just speed up my renders uh, tremendously. So it's really, really nice. It's, and it gives you great results, as you can see here. So V-Ray Denoiser is really, really great. All right, I'm happy with this. Cool. So we only have one thing left to do. And that is, I need a black plastic, um, could be rubber, black plastic, anything. Just a little something for the, for, the, uh, for the cables. And this looks good. Let's bring that in and let's hook that up. And let's do another render. Cool. All right. That's pretty much it. That's what I did to uh, texture the robot that you saw in my uh, scene. So you can see how quickly you can build something that looks very complex, but really is quite simple. It's fast. It does not require any custom UV unwrapping, any custom texture painting, none of that. Now, obviously, if I, if I were to um, punch in a lot closer uh, on him, then I would want to go in, uh, lay out my UVs properly, uh, and give uh, you know give my robot a little bit more love. But for my keyframe illustration, uh, let me actually see if I can share my screen again. If I can figure out how to do that, I'm not sure that I can get out of that view. No, I think I'm still sharing actually. Okay, all right. Um, but for my keyframe illustration, this is really all I needed to tell the story. Hang on a second. Some things are happening. All right. Are we guys doing all right? Let me try sharing my screen again. How are we doing? All right, I think we're back. Cool. Sorry, guys. Hi. Uh, all right. So let me get back to my rant. So basically, this way you can do something ve that looks very complex, but is technically actually very simple to make. Uh, it doesn't require anything, anything custom, anything like that. Um, 
for my scene, this is honestly really everything I needed to do to tell my story. And it, uh, it only took me one evening. So it's really fast and it's really flexible. It's a great way of working. And you can also keep it as simple as you want, like I did, like you saw me do with a robot, or you can make it as complicated as you want with multiple layers of materials and textures, and you can go absolutely crazy. And I went a little bit more complex on the car. So let's take a quick look at that. There, no, one second, there we go, all right. We start off again, same thing. We start off with the base materials, uh, all grabbed right from the, from the material library. We have the red car paint, a glass, a metal, and uh, a plastic, uh, black plastic. Very simple, nothing fancy. Then we move on to dirt. I promised you I would talk a lot about dirt today. So first layer of dirt. And for that, I just like to use a gradient ramp. Uh, I just want to gradate the, uh, the dirt from the bottom going up. That's the very, very first step. And there we go. Then we add, uh, we add the first layer of dirt breakup. And this is the smaller detail. Then we add larger breakup. And then we add V-Ray dirt. And I'm just gonna go back and forth so you can see a little bit of the difference because it is subtle again, but you see how it really gets into the nooks and crannies and it softens everything out. And it just adds that, one more, uh, that more realism to it. It makes it feel more grounded. It just makes it look nicer and makes, makes it uh, feel all, makes it feel cohesive. And then we also have some splatter from the tires. It's a really dirty car. I should have added wash me on top of it. I should have, maybe, maybe next time. All right, so that was the first layer of dirt. Now I'm gonna add a second layer of dirt. This time it's a little bit darker. Uh, you can see the material is darker and I'm using another V-Ray dirt. And again, subtle difference. I'm going back and forth. Uh, take a look at maybe towards the back of the license plate. You can see it there a little bit. It just adds that, you know, just again, just a little bit of a dust and dirt where maybe the rain didn't get to, it didn't wash it off. Uh, it just, it just helps. It adds an extra layer of dimensionality to your image and to your asset and to your look dev. And then last but not least, more dirt. Um, but this time I'm using a cellular map and I'm just using it to give me some of those droplets. You know, like if they, if they drove through puddles and water was splashing up, um, then this just gives me a little bit of those droplets uh, on the windows and on the car. So that's pretty much it. So you can see it's a little bit more complex than the robot, not extreme. I could have gone further, trust me. I can, I can do dirt for days but uh, just enough to make it more complex, make it feel just more layered, uh, more interesting, um, and just overall more fun to look at. So if we have time, I'll be really quick, I promise. Uh, I just want to quickly show you guys the compositing aspects. And again, uh, I don't have time to go into the details of this, so hopefully somebody else covered this already or is going to cover it. But uh, we have a lot of functionalities now in the V-Ray frame buffer, right there in, uh, right there in the, uh, you know, in your whatever software you choose. Uh, I'm working in 3ds Max, so right in here, I can see, I can apply different, different uh, post-process effects, basically. So this is my raw render. I applied uh, the denoiser, uh, a lens effect, uh, just a little bit of, it's just a little bit of bloom on the lights at the back there and a little bit of exposure adjustments. Then I play around with my color balance, get in a little bit of that cyan, trying to go for a little bit more of a cinematic look. And this guy really helps me bring, bring me there. And it's the filmic tone map. And this is new as well. And uh, it comes with a couple of presets. Uh, I choose this one because I really loved the contrast and the dark. It makes everything pop. I feel like I'm working on a Marvel movie. It's amazing. And yeah. 
And this is ultimately my final image uh, that I did. So you can see, you can get very, very far just inside the V-Ray frame buffer. It's, uh, it's, it's great. It's a good way to test out your scene, see where you want to go with it. And I think that's all I have for you guys. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there was something interesting in there for you. And yeah, that's it. Thank you, Sonia. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Appreciate Amazing. it. <laughs> Sorry for the hiccup <laughs> in between. <laughs> oh, it's fine. You inspired me to use dirt. I mean, seriously, I have to try it. Because <laughs> Tell you're you. the master. You're the Tell master. You. Dirt. Put it on everything. It's amazing. <laughs> I know. You get addicted, right? If it works, it works. You have to do it again and again. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Teddy, is there any questions? Or... Yes. Yes. Actually, we have so one question. Answer. How to change the dirt from the edges to the crevices? That's a question which came... You can adjust it with your ambient versus the inner occlusion. So you can play with that setting. Thank you. Mm. Let me see if there are some more questions. Guys, don't be shy. Ask questions. We love questions. Everybody loves questions. Yes. And likes. Press like. That's why we're live. <laughs> I know. We can be interactive. We're learning from each other. Okay, uh, Sonia, can you distort size? Distort size, yes, that's uh, the UVW randomizer that I talked about briefly. So you can change, you can randomize the scale, you can randomize um, all kinds of things, and you can actually specify the values by how much you want to randomize certain things. So there's a lot of options in there you can play with. Okay, and if there are no other questions, I think we can Thank you, Sonia, for the Thank great you. presentation. And Thanks. yes, and say hi to Christo, Owen, and Yop. Hi, guys. You joined us a bit later, but we're very happy to have you. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. Yeah, you guys can hear me? Yes, we hear you great. Awesome. Thank you. So first, let me say how awesome this is. And... We should not wait for the stupid virus next time to make more of these events. Global, lots of people, quick and, you know, it's uh, hopefully faster to organize than these big ass events that you have to fly people and hotels and all this kind of stuff. So let's have these things more often. Yeah, yeah. faster to organize. <laughs> I don't know about this, but yes, it, it's an amazing experience. <laughs> Absolutely, that's it's, it's, for it's, sure. I love these things. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I have, I'm, I'm running my timer because I have to be quick and uh, I have a lot of stuff to show and it's quite experimental. So let's, let's try to have some fun. So what I want to be talking to, to you guys today about is how to build a city from OSM and some assets in Houdini. So uh, Houdini has been known mostly as a platform that people do simulation work in. But more and more, uh, it's being used uh, in, for, for lighting. And now that we have V-Ray in there, we have had a, a few projects lately that we have been building these big uh, assets in Houdini. And it's, it's really amazing. Uh, it's nothing that can compare too much to it. So um, what I have done here is that I have taken some data from OSM that you can just download from the internet, um, like kind of a... Uh, all the good stuff that people can be inputting as data from real cities. I think I have taken Chicago here and I have some uh, buildings, I have some trees, everything is at this kind of, you know, uh, kind of mock-up stage, but I think enough to showcase just what can be done. And um, you can see that this thing is very fast and even time to first pixel is very fast and everything is very optimizable because you know, Houdini, it does give you quite a lot more control than most of the other DCCs I have played with. Uh, and the way that geometry is presented, you know, we have some types, some geometry representations, which are good for editing, where you can see all the polys and all the words and you can move everything around. And uh, sometimes you want things to be very fast and uh, to be able to uh, render uh, lots of geometry quickly. And these are different things. So it's not the same geometry for, for these two purposes. So 
So this is great as that uh, giving you access to uh, uh, to both of these, and of course you have to manage it, but still a, uh, it can uh, be awesome. So I want to just go very quickly to this whole thing, how this whole thing works. I promise it's not it's not over complicated. It's something that I put together uh, quickly after work. So uh, let's get going. Now I have this OSM here. Um, it's very nice. Uh, in Houdini, you can just. Uh, yeah, go download, um, uh, click on no, you import. There's a lot of things in here and uh, there's lots of stuff in this endless, huge, scary chart of all these things that you could have on uh, these places in the map that we have input. Uh, but to make- Sorry to jump screen... in, but Christo, are you sharing your screen? Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. This was sweet. Don't worry, <laughs> it's okay. okay. <laughs> so you then you missed the, the rendering that I had. Let me see if I can get it here. Okay, so uh, extremely quickly, maybe should I do it again? Okay, no time. So yeah, basically build a um, city from OSM. So the OSM map is in here, and it has a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of buildings and stuff. So and all of these things you can see the tiny thing is in there are buildings. Um, this is quite a lot, so we don't really want to be dealing with the whole thing all the time. So just isolate one tiny area. I mean, but and by tiny, I mean like a couple of um, kilometers in each direction. So um, I can then deal separately with the buildings, with the roads, and with the greenery. So if I go to the buildings first, what I can do is to filter out all of these uh, things which are not buildings. So that's easy. And then I'm left with all of these, let me just make it, I'm left with all of these um, kind of rectangular thingies, you know, like outlines, the contours of the buildings. So I can uh, identify each one of them separately and I can measure them because what I want to do is to get all of these uh, areas, which are, are like a full neighborhood and uh, to treat these things separately. I think these are really big buildings, which are um, kind of wide area and these are not fitting with uh, the, the buildings that I want to scatter on top of these things. So I just want to filter these guys out and um, I will slightly go back in here. Uh, to mention that uh, the buildings that we uh, are going to be scattering today are buildings like these guys. So something that you can buy in any pack that people sell over the internet all the time. So just buy a package and it arrives like this and uh, you will need to kind of organize it, um, transform it so it fits your, your size, uh, the, the size of the scene. And then the absolutely key thing here is what you can see down there. It says path. Now, unlike anything, any of the other DCCs I have tried, uh, I think maybe Clarice is coming closer, but in Houdini, you don't get this list, like the outliner list. I mean, you do get the outliner list, but it's of uh, kind of nodes, not of, um, of these geometry that you, that you are dealing with. So, Usually you get these kind of things exported from somewhere. It looks a little bit awful. Uh, and what all that I want is the name of the building and the name of the material and uh, leave it at that. So I do a couple of operations which are dealing with uh, these strings, with these sentences. And you can see that they are separated by these slashes. So just juggle these slashes around uh, so I can get like, let's say, only the um, piece that I like from each of these uh, slash separated list. And I can replace things that I don't like with things that I like. like. So here, for example, I'm just making everything which contains glass be glass and everything which contains solid be concrete. And this looks a little bit geeky, but it does allow you to do everything. And you can have multiple of these organizations uh, for different purposes. It's like the ultimate flexibility and it's abuse. So, if these things change completely, somebody else has gives me another package. Like let's say producer said, oh, yeah, I guess they was on the internet and I found something that it's much better than the shit that you guys have been coming up with. So yeah, please use that. 
I just cook it up in the uh, in this in this input, like merge these two together, and the whole thing still work still works. I don't need to redo anything. I need to to add a couple of rules maybe, but everything else just works, and this is saving untold amounts of time. Um, so. After these couple of operations, you can see that I am I have just built an, another name, which is much cleaner. It is just here the name of the building and the, the name of the material, like I've kind of typed with the material, and a number for the like uh, piece, the piece, which again something that automatically gets uh, created. For, uh, and for the piece, which I can check out in here. So this is all the individual small tiny pieces that my mesh is contain uh, is contained. And uh, I can use these pieces then to, to do randomized shaders or any of this kind of stuff. Um, there is a bunch of strangely named attributes from where it was uh, coming from. So I just rename them and clean them up and uh, get rid of all the stuff that I don't really need. And at the end, I have pretty much what I like, but there is one thing that um, I want to add. So all of these areas that you saw there in the in the OSM map, they are different sized. So I said, okay, uh, I have these different sized buildings. So uh, won't it be cool if I have like a bigger building where there is a bigger spot and a smaller building where there is a smaller spot? So whenever we have these neighborhoods of tiny uh, houses, they uh, they will get kind of tiny houses and not skyscrapers. So uh, that's another thing which is like you know. Houdini is you just you just stop stuff like there is no roadblock anywhere. It's it's amazing. I'm on drugs. Um, in the Houdini drugs. So uh, let me see where was that. Okay, uh, and all that I uh, that I had to do was to make bounding boxes of each of these individual uh, buildings. Again, I just uh, loop, which is basically go through all of the of these pieces, which are uh, the things that I individually named buildings. Create a bounding box and um, uh, copy the attributes of the name of the building so each bounding box not, knows which buildings it belongs to. And then I can measure its volume. So I know which are the bigger uh, guys and which are the smaller ones. And uh, make the bigger buildings know uh, which is uh, their volume. Because, you know, they, the, the bounding boxes have the same name like the bigger buildings, so they can easily get connected. And then um, this packing thing is what is making the geometry from the state which is good for editing into the state which is good for light. So you can see now I have only 34, and I used to have you know each uh, polygon as a separate thing. These are tens of thousands or like hundreds of thousands. So whenever I pack these things up, I cache them as alembics. And this is happening uh, on the render farm. As you can see here, deadline uh, is hooked up to publishing it to Shotgun automatically, uh, all of these kinds of uh, cool stuff. Everything gets automated. And then I'm ready to place buildings. So let's return to the uh, stuff that was on the map. Here's my map. And on the map, I uh, have split out these large areas, which are like these guys. And the rest is the small areas, which are like these guys. And now, because I don't want to uh, deal too much, I don't want to have an, an area, I want to have a point which I place my building on top. So I just hit extra center. So it's giving me the center of all of these rectangular thingies and I get the points to place my building something. And at this point it looks like a nighttime uh, you know Los Angeles if you fly through or I guess Chicago because that's where I can take the USM map from uh, and with these colored points. And there is something uh, a little bit more interesting here where I uh, derive the orientation of each of these rectangles because I want my buildings to be correctly oriented. Uh, and Houdini, besides making uh, uh, giving you a bounding box node, it's giving you an oriented uh, bounding box. So it contains the orientation, which I do a couple of operations here to um, send it to an, a type of information that the points can use for um, to transfer these uh, orientation. 
Okay, okay, okay. So that's basically it. This is this is my uh, building points. Uh, the thing that you can see here is the assembly. So um, I have these geo nodes on the left side, which is where I build stuff, and I have the look on the right, which is where I uh, collect the stuff together for lighting. Uh, so I have some roads, and the roads are again simple. So there's this big piece of USM, a uh, small piece of USM map, and I just filter out the stuff that I need. So like uh, one uh, one group for the bigger roads, one group for the smaller roads. Uh, I clean them up so it doesn't have too many uh, necessary attributes, and I assign them some width, and I sweep them, which is to say make make them make them have uh, thickness. And the OSM map has uh, information on some of the roads, how many lanes they have. So I use that. On the other ones, I just you know imagine a number. Uh, the bigger ones I assume to be wider, and the smaller ones I assume to be to be smaller. And then again, uh, pack it to be in a in a like a this lightable state. Now the important thing is that this is a, like a small section. So if I go to the thing which isolates, and if I say okay. Give me something which is in a different part of the city. Let's say I want to to check out to, to, to test with 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 this part part of the city, which is like a little bit you know to the side. I go up, and it's going to take a couple of seconds to reevaluate to do all of these operations that we just spoke of, and it's going to give me the city. So it's how magical and cool is that? Uh, and okay, I have the roads figured out. Now there is the greenery, which is um, something that I have just picked up as from the from the uh, this section of the OSM. So now anywhere that I use the OSM, I just use the section uh, that I have uh, cut out. And whenever I say, okay, I need the whole white city, I just turn off the section. Everything is this super packed geometry instance. It doesn't matter, you know. It, it can be planets of this kind. So. Um, what I do with these with these guys is that I don't want trees on top of the buildings and on the roads. So uh, I put in some points on this uh, piece of ground first, and then I use the um, a volume which I make from the buildings and from the roads. This is the kind of thing that looks a little bit blobby. That's a representation of uh, of the volume kind of uh, iso surface. And I can use that volume to select the, all the trees which are, would be inside the roads and the um, buildings. And I look at these guys. Okay, so I have the points that I'm going to be placing my trees on. And I have these trees just like I have the buildings. There is one thing, there is a couple of things um, on, um, uh, in, in this uh, lighting ready package. So, okay, this is pretty much uh, enough. Let's go to the assembly. So the assembly is something that does not contain any geometry. So nothing is being built here. When you do, the, when you render the stuff with VI standalone, because on the farm you want to, to uh, be only paying for VI licenses, not put in licenses, and because it's going to be starting up so much faster and be so much more memory efficient. So you just render with VI standalone on the farm. Uh, there is not, there is no, there is nothing else like there is no put in. And uh, let me see if I. Can check out these are, these are my buildings so you can just throw a quick render and this is going to be rendering the node that i have just selected only from the camera uh, so the camera and sorry, I just to home in on these buildings so here's some buildings and Again, you know, everything is procedural. So whenever build, building, uh, building small change, somebody gets a new pack, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, everything updates. So I have signed here some, if I look maybe closer, maybe my color choices a little bit blind. I'm a little bit color blind in my defense. Um, so yeah, there is, there, is, uh, there is metal, there is glass, and there is concrete. And the way that these have been picked up is interesting because if you can see here, you don't see any, like, you don't know anything about this job. You just know that this is a building, uh, and that's basically it. So how to assign a material to something that you can't really see, like you can't select, you don't know anything about it. So fortunately, go to the shaders. These are the building shaders. Andre has been awesome. 
and he wrote this thing, which is um, enabling you to look inside these um, uh, these packed things and uh, give you some uh, match uh, the name that we have been, we have built, and it's gonna it's gonna give me an ID for each of these things that have different names. So let's say glass or concrete or metal, and it's gonna um, uh, allow me to uh, wire uh, multi multi ID materials. Uh, which would be used for each of these separate things. So I can't stress this enough, you know, procedural nature of this, everything which is named, you know, something which contains glass is going to get this material. Everything is, uh, is going to, that's going to uh, name something like metal is, is getting the other material. Then on top of this, I can layer other adjustments and colorations and all this kind of stuff. But this is basically my whole setup, which assigns materials. And I, I did not know about this kind of assignment when I was making my assets. So um, the asset guy is just doing his thing and then lighting guy is doing his own thing. So if I just open up the concrete here, uh, there is a color that I have just put in because it's my kind of base color. There is a user color that I'm reading from the geometry actually. So when I spread out to different areas and I can, I can paint uh, like a different thing on, on each instance or I can uh, randomize or uh, use noise, anything like that is going to be done. So if I render, go here to the bottom and say render, that's a different um, section of the city from the one that I originally rendered um, that I showed in the, in the intro when I was not wisely was not sharing my screen with you guys. Uh, but yeah, it has, it has just been regenerated. Um, everything is rendering super quick. I can go in and all the way to uh, like one of the buildings, maybe. There's a skyscraper thing. There you go. And this is the beginning of my setup. So um, I have a minute more. And let's see if you guys get questions afterwards. But um, I wanted to touch on a couple of the other things. Uh, because there is a couple of smart things happening in here. So this is the, the place where I uh, measure the size of the building because I can measure the size on the points, but I have not measured the size of the building. So I want to match the big buildings to the big uh, points. You know? So I, I do exactly the same thing. I do the bounding box and the measurements. But then I just sort these guys by size and uh, uh, then I have like one to uh, zero to 33 sort of things by size, sort of points by size, it, it basically quite, quite a simple thing. Everything is moved to, to, the, big, to, to the origin. So um, it coincides with the location of the point. Let me see if there's anything interesting. Um, there is different types of, uh, yeah, one set of points for the uh, bigger ones or the smaller ones. Uh, this is the tree. Everything is getting like different colors based on, let's maybe just throw in some color thing here. Maybe it's autumn and like some of the trees are starting to become yellowish. Yeah. Or maybe red. So that's how you assign your colors, or um, this can be any other type of variation, like what kind of tree it is, or um, whatever you can think of, think of, um, like uh, different tonelesses or stuff like this. I don't know why this is not changing in the viewport. Maybe I have missed something. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it, you know, uh, big, huge cities from OSM. Uh, and this is looking much more interesting than what you would otherwise build like from a completely procedural. So this kind of mix mixture of procedural and assets is something that has been really useful for us and something I really want to show because this feels like you know, this is the way to do these really big and complex things. So yeah, thank you guys. I'm gonna, of course, be uh, sharing the scene, these assets, everything with you. So whoever wants to play, uh, can play. And have a, have a, hopefully, at least as good time uh, as, as I'm here.
So yeah, that's basically it. My time is up. I was relatively principled this time. You were perfect. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for kind of you for sharing. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that people will appreciate that. Oh yeah. Hopefully you like it. Thank um, you very much, Christo. Agreeing to do a live demo at the 24-hour <laughs> live stream. That's you're you're a risk taker, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I like to live living on the edge. <laughs> yeah, but it worked great. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Very well. If you have any questions, just write me up on uh, Messenger, on Facebook, whatever. I'm everywhere. Yes, guys. If you have questions for Christian, I'm sure you do the habit to answer. So we can move in on the next topic. Uh, we have an amazing talk with Andra and Tom. Are you guys are ready to tell us more about this conversation we're going to have? All set. You just say All the set. word. Okay. So tell us everything. <laughs> Well, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm Tom. Um, I'm the marketing specialist and community specialist on the Corona team. So I'm going to start with the presentation. Should be 10 minutes or so. Uh, while I'm talking, please write in your questions for Andre. We'll keep them for the end to answer what you want to know. It doesn't have to be about what's in my presentation. So um, just uh, feel free to ask as we go. And then we've got a bit of time at the end to answer those. So um, let me just start with a share screen. So um, uh, can everybody see that? Silence, does that mean there's no, no shared screen? Oh. That's alarming. I don't know why I can't hear anything. What's happened to my Zoom? Okay, it wants me to pick which screen I'm sharing. I see. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Now can everybody see the screen? Awesome. So this is the joke that next year you'll be able to walk up to any random stranger and say, I know what you did last summer. Nothing, because of course we've all been trapped in lockdown for so long. Uh, but it's not true. The uh, Corona team, of course, are just too creative to be sitting around doing nothing. So what I'm going to do is um, take a look at what we've been doing over the last summer, what we've been up to for the last few months. First up, of course, we have um, Corona Vendor 6. Um, the Cinema 4D version came out last week. Max version came out on Monday, so um, all very recently. Uh, but we're not just going to look at the software. We're going to look at the people, and we're going to start there, too. What have we been up to in our free time while trapped under lockdown? So we're going to start with uh, Martin, who has found a brand new way to mow his lawn. Um, you can see here um, that his drone is all covered in grass. Until his flying skills improve, um, yeah, this drone is going to be uh, a way for him to keep the grass nice and short. Uh, he tells me that this drone will take some really nice 4K footage eventually once he learns how to pilot it. Um, on, a, on a safer note, he also purchased a, a new earthbound camera rather easier to control than the flying one. Um, so he tells me the deciding factors here for um, the excellent Fujifilm filters that comes built in. Uh, and in fact, he can use some old Russian M42 lenses um, via an adapter, so fair enough. The um, Corona button is not included in the purchase. Anyway, for photography with both drone and camera, he's gonna need some great lighting. So I hope he gets lighting that's as great as the new Sun and Sky system and Corona 6. You'll get used to these really terrible links that I have built to swap back and forth. Um, so it has two major benefits. Um, first, you can see here the sun is below the horizon, but the sky is still, you know, it's very light. This is as twilight as it gets um, back with um, Corona Vendor 5. Um, Apparently, the sky is not 
good for those who love Twilight, and by that I mean the lights, not the movies. Uh, if we switch over to Corona Vendor 6 with the new Sun and Sky system, no change. The only thing I've done is change the, the Sun and Sky system. And we have this beautiful uh, Twilight or Dawn look. Um, it's accurate up to 5.4 sun diameters below the horizon. That's negative 2.85 degrees. Uh, and here's uh, same scene again, rendered twice with the old and new system um, just displayed side by side. So you can see exactly what kind of a difference that makes. Now, it's, it's not the only advantage of, uh, of the new system. It's also um, giving you better results in full daylight. So you don't just have to be doing dawn and twilight. Um, it's got a much nicer tint to the, to the daylight. This is the old system. And it actually has kind of a greenish tint. You may not notice it here, but I'll swap back and forth. Here's the new one. And here's the old one. So you can see that this is slightly more greenish and this is, to my mind, a much more natural look, a much more appealing look. So those are the benefits of the um, new Sun and Sky system. Uh, here's one more shot. I, I applied some, uh, enabled the texture mode for the sun, um, basically because we haven't been able to travel. Let's all just take a second. Imagine we've gone on vacation to some beautiful tropical island. Okay, now back to reality. So talking of travel, um, we're going to take a look at what Jakob has been up to. Um, he spent his time traveling around uh, ancient Egypt and feudal Japan, searching out elusive um, platinum trophies. So it's not some sort of modern day Indiana Jones. Um, rather, this was in Assassin's Creed Origins and uh, Ghost. I've got to try and say this properly, Ghosts of Shusima. Um, and we don't have any photos of his travels, so this is just a, a random render from our gallery. But here he is with his, his other um, hobby that he's picked up over the lockdown, which is uh, rediscovering the charm of 90s uh, hockey cards after 20 years of not paying any attention to them. With lots of free time on his hands, he got back into it and it kind of took on a life of its own, he tells me. Um, his collection's grown from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand. Um, they're mostly worthless, he says, um, but they are full of childhood memories for him. Um, this is him with a, what apparently is a beer and cards session. I'm beginning to wonder if the beer part of that isn't why he ended up with thousands of cards, because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but he has a, an Instagram set up for this now. So if you want to hear the stories um, behind the various cards, uh, and the players on them, you can follow him um, at Hockey Card Stories. Uh, come on, you know you want to. Let's rack up his followers. But he's not just done all this kind of childish stuff. He's also done some adulting. He and his girlfriend uh, bought a house, bought a house in April. Um, then they had to figure out how to sign all the paperwork and pick floors and doors and um, all the other stuff while being in lockdown. Nice timing. Um, luckily, pandemic hasn't disrupted the construction work, so um, they should be moving in by the end of the year. He tells me that, unfortunately, he lent uh, Ghost of Tsushima to his friend, so we can't see him in his kick-ass samurai army. Uh, uh, armor, sorry. Or at least so he says. Let's just see if we take a closer look at this image by zooming in. Ah, uh, yes, I thought so. Uh, there he is, all dressed up in his gear. And with that sharp sword and menacing armor, you might say he is quite an evil glare. Glare, that's my painfully forced link to the new Bloom and Glare settings in Kona 6. We've got the new lens effects um, that um, share technology with, uh, with Vive. Uh, one of my personal favorites, along with the new Sun and Sky system, uh, 
And yeah, this is also the new Sun and Sky system in the scene. We can just flick through um, and see some of the different examples that are possible. Um, I think the results are much more realistic than the old bloom and glow. Um, but you also have much more creative control, as you can see, to, to change those up. So it doesn't have to be realistic. This is pretty wild, I don't know, um, which is fantastic. Uh, as a note, this here is um, also the new Bloom and Glow. Um, I use the Corona image editor, uh, and this is just a JPEG, but you can save it into an EXR, load it into the image editor, uh, and apply all the tone mapping and Bloom and Glow and similar. Um, obviously, JPEGs are not full high dynamic range, but um, I, I mean, if you're saving RAWs from your camera, as I like to do, then you do indeed have full dynamic range and the Corona image editor makes a really cool photo editing tool as well. So back to the team, Monica. Monica has been putting this all to shame. She didn't learn just one new skill, not just two new skills, she learned three new skills over the course of the summer. Um, so first she bought a, a, a cookbook, uh, a book on cooking. Uh, and that might put you in mind of something like Miss Randall, um, you know, olive oil and chopping boards. But, but Monica has her priorities right. Um, the book is, in fact, created by uh, one of the most well-known bars in Brno. That's all about preparing alcoholic cocktails. Now, that's the kind of cooking we can all agree is fun. Um, she says her cooking skills have improved a lot. And for those drinks, if they're shaken and not stirred, uh, the new Phoenix FD uh, implementation where we've implemented foam uh, in Corona 6 may be really useful. Yeah, I told you some of these links would be quite the stretch. So her other two skills, she also applied for uh, a modern calligraphy course. Uh, she describes that as like going back to the first year of school and learning writing the alphabet from the beginning. She didn't say if the calligraphy got better or worse after enjoying the results of her cooking. Um, and the other thing that she picked up was sewing. She started with masks. I wonder where that idea came from. Uh, but then she moved on to skirts, caps, and other clothes. Now, if you're thinking of learning this, um, her advice was it turns out that it's three times more expensive and takes a hundred times as much energy as just going out and buying some new clothes, but it is fun and kind of relaxing. So while doing her sewing, she was probably after some nice eye-catching patterns, but that's exactly what we don't want in, uh, in our randos. Um, unfortunately, we had a nice demo of this from Sonia earlier on with the robot. Um, the UVW randomizer in Corona 6 also has the um, stochastic tiling to randomize things. So we have this, we have a lovely seamless texture, we scale it to fit our scene and uh, patterns. But with the application of the new randomization techniques, uh, we end up with uh, the kind of result we were really looking for. Uh, and here's a side-by-side -side demo uh, of it in use. Um, this is actually using the procedural uh, 3ds Max swirl map uh, and the randomization works perfectly well on that. As long as this is in UVW space, you can use the UVW randomization. As for Matevs, he used the lockdown to scan materials he could normally scan because normally there's uh, masses of tourists swarming all over the place. Um, but that changed due to the lockdown. Um, he had to go through checkpoints. Uh, he could only pass with valid proof it was for work, so he'd Roll on up to the checkpoint and explain he needed to take photos of concrete walls and floors uh, because he works for the Kevin and our team. Uh, he does say that police were not amused, and I imagine they were probably even confused about what was so exciting about walls and floors. But they did let him through. Um, so this is you know the many photos that go into just one material. Um, he found himself like a VIP, complete access to everything behind the scenes, nobody else around. Uh, walking around with this giant uh, cross polarized ring flash, which he describes as looking like the centrifuge from a washing machine, it's pretty huge. Uh, and frantically photographing concrete walled floors, and uh, it must have made a real 
odd site for anybody uh, else who was there, uh, just all the things we do for 3D. So he relates he felt untouchable uh, and it was such an emotional experience, he even cried under the shower <laughs> later that night. Uh, and here we see the materials um, taking shape in the 3D software. And this is the only time I have a link that actually makes sense back to that Chrome 6 features. Here's the new material library. Uh, we added um, three new categories, flooring, ceramic tiles, and carpet. 78 new materials in total. Uh, and here they are in some sample renders, well, a, a tiny fraction of the 78 new materials. We also had four corona babies uh, born over the summer. It means a lot of the team were learning how to go without sleep and change diapers. Um, I've spurred you any photographs of that. And instead, here we have this nice idealized render from our gallery instead. Uh, as for me, well, like Jacob, I did a lot of traveling. I fought off interdimensional invaders. I met up with some old friends. I explored strange new worlds. And then I got tired of the planet and uh, went off into space. Uh, none of those games have anything to do with Corona, of course. Um, for those of you who are interested, they were Control, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy XIV, and Elite Dangerous. And then I also decided to find out what um, VR gaming was all about. So I call these the four stages of, of VR gaming. The first is, ooh, this is cool. The second is, oh my, what is that? Uh, the next one is, ah, get out of the way from me, get out of the way from me. And then the last one is, wow, the sensation of falling is really realistic. And then I also bought a camera. It's also a Fuji by Marchand. Um, there's the blue and glare again, by the way. And I applied it on this photo of my guitar. And I bought this for photographing my equipment, making um, gear review videos and uh, making uh, videos to go along with my music. So I had a list of video games. Um, the video game Portal was not on there. So you might say, no more Portal. And I would say, yes, no more Portals because of the adaptive environment sampler that was introduced in Corona 6. Here's Corona 5. If you look at this shadow here, I'll flip across to Corona 6. Shadow is much more realistic and has much less noise. I'll get zoomed in uh, if you look on the wall and then the shadow on the floor hopefully it comes through on the on the zoom stream i don't know how clear it would be um, both of these are just two minute renders uh, to make sure there was still some noise visible kind of six better shadows and uh, much less noise so adaptivity um how can we turn that into a link we'll go with andre who is adapting to having been bitten by the guitar bug. Um, now he knows what every guitar player knows. You can't have just one. Uh, I'm sure by this time next year, there'll be even, there'll be even more uh, than just these two. Um, so you might guess from the way these are called black and spiky that because he's been learning tracks by his favorite artists like Taylor Swift, Billy Eilish and uh, Lil Nas X, uh, which of course is nothing like Andre's favorite music. Um, you can check it out in chat. Take your guesses, not the Corona team. Take your guesses, what kind of music does uh, Andre like? What's his favorite bands? Uh, and of course, there's tons more things in Corona 6. Um, we added the distance shader to the Cinema 4D version so that we can finally explain where crop circles come from. Um, we've added propagate masks and reflections and refractions. Uh, allows you to recolor things easier in post. You can see my mask here in um, Corona 5. Is, I can recolor the leaves in the book, but not in the reflection and the refraction without manually painting the mask. But with the propagate options, it's nice and easy to make those changes to everything all at once. Uh, and tons more. So much. So uh, I'm not going to go through it. Uh, and yeah, you're not meant to be able to read this. Um, to, uh, Head to the web page, there's the um, two release blogs, new feature videos, uh, and of course you can download it and try it for 45 days to see for yourself. I'm also sure the team got up to a lot more than what I've got here, but they just didn't dare share anything else with me in the presentation. 
and we don't have all day and you are tired of my cheesy jokes. So let's wrap up the presentation side. Um, however you reacted to this year, we can say that unlike this presentation, 2020 is something you're never gonna forget. Uh, so here's to uh, 2021 being a better year. Whatever else it has, it will have uh, lots more great updates to Corona and V-Ray, so watch this space. And I'm hoping I've got to that quick enough that we have time for questions. Do we have time for questions? Do we have any questions? Do we? To be okay, honest, so. we don't really have time for questions. Oh. Um, because we, but are... we love the presentation. It was great. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We loved it. Uh, the fall was quite unexpected. <laughs> uh, it, there was fake to go. So I have, you know, <laughs> found myself pointing in the wrong direction or, or slamming my hands into the table that I forget in front of me because I don't see it. No, but it was just too funny. I had to include that. So everybody is asking about your guitars, and I even see here Zap says that on the stream alone we have at least fifty guitars. I know. At least. <laughs> <laughs> and Andre has joined us with the bug. We'll have even more next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, next time we need to do a twenty-four hour guitar jam, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so without further ado, maybe we can introduce our panelists. Thank you guys for staying for the whole event with us. Uh, so we have on the panel, Joop van der Steen, Olaf Friodo, and Florentio Stantio from 3DS um, Romania. So guys, today, I can actually leave the floor to Nikos because he, he is the one who will be leading this discussion. Okay. Well, thank you guys for staying with us. Um, so the panel discussion, it's about the importance of community for the city industry. I think this event is all about community. I think we've managed for 24 hours to inspire so many people. So let's focus on the importance of community. And But first, I would like you guys to tell me your background and also the community you're part of, you know, and who wants to go first. Maybe you will have a volunteer or I can choose, I don't mind. I can see Lorenzo is, Lorenzo is smiling. Maybe you go to it first. Uh, sure. Uh, so um, 3DS Romania, uh, it started almost um, eight years ago. And it was based as a group for our workshop with 3DS Max. And uh, from then, um, we invited all our colleagues and the entire university and then universities around and the one in Cluj and like the whole country in the end. And it grew from a couple of uh, 50, 100 people to 1,000 and, and then to 1,500. And now we're close to 3,000 artists. So um, I great. didn't expect it that to happen. I just, uh, I was actually inspired by other artists like Ronan Beckerman or uh, Bertrand Benoit and Peter Guthrie, who were always sharing information. And I always learn from them. And I was thinking, why don't we have our own community or a place where we can um, share knowledge, uh, tutorials, maybe even in Romanian. And this is how um, things developed. That's amazing. What's the last time you had a gathering with them and you saw them in person? Uh, we had one in Cluj in, Feb in January. And the next one was supposed to be in February, March, but uh, started at uh, the same time COVID. So uh, everything was postponed. I'm, I'm sure many of members of the community, maybe they're watching now and I would like to thank you for inviting them. Your post, I, I saw them every day and your passion. I think it's great <laughs> what you're doing. And so uh, thanks for that and the introduction. Can I move to you and tell us about your background and the community you're part of? Yeah, I can. I've been doing this uh, event. I've been doing is the end user event, EOE. I think it's one of the oldest. I think over 20 years now, maybe. Wow. Yeah, something like that. So from, from the 2000s. 
<clears throat> that's how it started. That's when it started, basically. Uh, we never went for big. We went for fun. <laughs> that's basically it. So we sticked around 200, 250 people, and that's it. Because we hold the event in a pub. <clears throat> and the pub isn't bigger, so that's the whole idea. So we don't going to go anywhere else. It's just a pub. That's the place. That's where we started. That's where we end. And that's it. So no bigger event for us. No. I mean, I've been to your event three times already, and I have to say it was a unique experience for me. And I like the way you make it a bit more personal. I mean, this amazing idea that you can host like a dinner after and get us all involved and connected. That was amazing. I haven't seen that happening around in any other events. And I like yeah, the idea that yeah, we we we, tr we try to keep it as a, a family basically, and that's it. And also, uh, we start on a Wednesday evening. Everybody gets in another pub. We start off and we start talking and chatting and drinking. And <clears throat> we stop at Friday evening at seven. But we close the pub, and then we move to an apartment from my friend where we have a dinner with the speakers together. Just fun, relax, sit down, and have another beer and talk and just cool down. It's fun. I'm it's fun. It was a great experience for me, and I have great memories for these um, EWE events. And Good. what is happening at the moment? I, what is the EWE Connect? I saw something on the website, but I'm not 100% sure what's happening. Well, the, the, the pub uh, became, uh, it, it lost a couple of rooms, so we had to downsize. So first we did another location added to it, and then I was doing like, no, 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 no. And like I said, we've been doing it for 20 years. So the people who come, they, they are not looking for, let's say, more the regular stuff than on all the other events. So the, the, the lectures and everything interesting. We're, we're an old group, old people. They like to talk and go in depth and, and talk with the developers and other guys. So it, it has changed a little bit. So it's now about 150 people. And it's a real close group and we're off grid and so we can talk about anything we like to down there which is a good thing which we like absolutely. better yeah, yeah absolutely i love it hopefully i might be there one day then <laughs> um thank you for sharing that and can i also ask ola to join yeah. the conversation Tell us about your background. Mm -hmm. um yes my background um, i run an, uh, a company called raw format uh, and since uh, 2014, we have the, an ADD, Architecture Visualization Day in Gothenburg. Um, so a small event, um, we have had about 85 guests uh, and about uh, three to five speakers every year. Uh, and we were supposed to have our sixth uh, uh, event this May, but uh, Something came in between. I know what happened. <laughs> yeah. We all know what happened. Um, and it, it's so the last time you see the community was May, or? Yes, uh, the last time was uh, supposed to happen in May. And uh, now we're sitting down and then talking about what, what's going to happen post pandemic. What are we going to do? That's going to help me actually to go to the next question. Um, so, for your community, guys, what do you think is next for you? Do you have any plans or you just wait to see what's going to happen to the world and then make decisions? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, the pandemic has been great because uh, everybody has learned that it's quite easy to, to join in these uh, webinars and uh, to have meetings uh, with Zoom and Google Meets and Teams and whatever. But I think everybody's really hungry to meet live uh it's it's something more it, it adds something more to meet in real life than just down and uh talk and share and uh, of course have an occasional beer but i think uh, i think we have to organize maybe some small groups maybe some uh, some uh, after uh, uh i'm not sure but I think we have well, to meet. Smaller groups might be, can, can be an idea for now, you know, and just yes, keep, yes. keep going. Uh, I'm sure these meetings will generate ideas anyway, even if it's a small yes. thing, you might generate big ideas, you know, that's the community yeah. events. Exactly. Yeah, great. You guys want to talk about it? Can I jump in? Uh, can yes. I jump in here for a second? So besides the other stuff, I'm uh, 
done that it came in this uh, I'm like bigger part, big part of uh, the community that we are organizing here. It's called CGBG, uh, kind of like computer graphics in Bulgaria. So our uh, plan was quite different than than these other events. You know, everybody people being to the to the EUE, which is uh, Europe's amazing, outstanding, awesome event. And uh, th there's people have been to SIGGRAPH and so on. And these are these huge events that, have, that gather people from everywhere. What we did on our side was an event which was monthly. So like we had it every four weeks. And we gathered mostly people from the city. And we have about a thousand people in the city, I think, who do computer graphics from lots of different, uh, different areas. So every month we did uh, an event which is specialized in, in different fields. So um, you have here visual effects one time, then you have architecture, you have games people, then you have people from in the installations that run, you know, the, the, the projection mappings and stuff like that. And we had about 100 people every, uh, every month, uh, I think between 100 and 200, and it was being really su successful. There was a great space that we used to have it in there for free, uh, but with the pandemic, everything went out. So then when we had, had these uh, problems of increasing distance between the people inside, com inside the company that are on, you know, bottle ship, we uh, had uh, this idea as one way to mitigate that is to have, have a meeting in person uh, every, every well, like once a week with the entire team in the park. So, uh, so everybody is a little bit more relaxed. There is no, yeah. So we just go in the park, you get pizza and beer, and you spend a night. So we leave work early. Uh, so it's about 5, I think, 5 p.m. And we stay in the park and just talk until 11 or 12 at night. And it's been so, like, especially in the beginning, it, it has been such a huge relief that you can see for people just doing social stuff. In the beginning, we didn't even talk about, about work much. We just We were just hanging out and we were just talking, just enjoying that we can actually meet each other. And then eventually we started inviting other people. So people that, that uh, we really liked from, from the community and just ask them, okay, maybe, maybe do you want to come and uh, talk to our to, to us for, you know, just, just we, we buy a couple of beers and you talk to us in the park about something. And we did this a couple of times and this looks like the rebirth in the Corona age uh, of, of the event. So we want to, um, do something for the next time that maybe we're going to ask a small number of people to come in. And again, like one of these guys from the other companies that you just, you just chat in a completely casual way, but you give them most of the time to speak. So basically you, you ask them questions and they answer. Everything is very casual. People are talking on the side. It's, it's a meeting in the park. So that's something that we are, that we are going to be trying out in the, in the, in the next weeks. And because we've been blessed with nature, there is a couple of mountain houses. I mean, there is like a dozen mountain houses, half an hour drive from here. So another thing that we want to be doing is uh, just have like a half a day in the weekend in, in September, October, weather is really, really nice that we go and meet, not in the park maybe, but, but in one of these mountain houses. And the thing that, the, that you can really do in the pandemic that you can't do otherwise is workshops. So whenever the weather gets cold and, uh, and people don't really spend all of their, their day at the beach or in the mountains like it's now, we want to start weekends that we do like an entire day of workshop where you go into really detail in, in, in depth with something and this will not cost anything much to organize. You get one of these uh, meetings like we are doing now and go really in depth and uh, broad discussion and something like that. And then just compensate the rest with drinks in the park. So this is the plan basically on our side. I like the plan. Sounds like you have an idea. I mean, if if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, can you please let us know how it went? Share some photos, maybe with us. You know, uh, inspire other people maybe to do the same thing. We need to keep meeting as much as possible, even on the small groups. I believe in this. Uh, Zap Anderson make a good comment before that we definitely need the new total chaos happen next year. Absolutely, we need to meet in person. This connectivity we're looking for is amazing. I mean, this event 24 hours inspired us all. We shared ideas. But yes, meeting a person is a big thing, right? So maybe that can ask, I can go to the next question then about, you know, how important then is to meet the community members in person? And do you think COVID is going to actually change the way we meet on events? Well, for, for example, um, we weren't allowed till five days ago to meet more than 50 people uh, anywhere. <laughs> and though the statistics are still going up, 
uh, we're allowed now to meet, let's say, 100. And I was thinking to go like, um, um, like you said, um, go less informal, go in the park, uh, at least say hello from distance and we still can uh, have. This might continue for a while. So I think that's a great idea. You know, I, I love what we're doing here and online is amazing to bring all this community together. But yes, let's continue meeting in person as, as much as we can. I think you already inspired me. I will try to do the same thing with the community in Greece and we'll have some people that they, lo they love to meet. I will try to do a small gathering. And um, Teddy, I know you have questions as well. Do you want to get involved and continue the, the chat together? Um, or I can, you know. Um, I have one last question and then we need to announce the winners. Um, I know. But my question is, so what's next? I mean, for me, the biggest success of this event that we did today is that we set out, set it as a goal for ourselves. It was, it seemed like something really impossible to do. Everybody in the beginning, you, I'm sure you even didn't believe that it would happen. Like it was some crazy idea by Nigel and and me and the other Teddy. And um, so, what's next, guys? I mean, obviously, when we join forces, we can do anything. I would say. That's true. And we've made it, to be honest. We're three hours and going. Yeah. It's, well, it's a record, isn't it? So who wants to say what's next, guys? I know you're all expertise. You have, you're supporting your communities and you're doing well. So what's next? Who yeah, what's the future of community management, let's say, of what we're doing? How can we continue growing the community and building the best we can all together as one? But you can grow by downsizing. So uh, gather up in small groups and uh, have small lectures online and discuss it afterwards, uh, as Mölle said, said mm -hmm. in, in parks or outside. Or, um, I think small groups at first. Small groups, yeah. I think Christo made a good point, but meeting outside even for now in a small group, I think this can keep things moving for a while, you know? giving us the inspiration, the power to continue the creative journey we're all in and keep inspiring ourselves and supporting each other. I think supporting is a good word because we all have to support each other these days, right? That's what community yeah. is about. That's why we're all here today and for the next 24 hours, it's, it's, it's been a journey for me. Um, great. So guys, what's, who wants to go in? Well, a, a good people? example is what Fabio did a couple of months ago with all the competitions, because when everyone was in lockdown for two months, I uh, couldn't go out, you couldn't do basically nothing and just work. And Fabio gave a lot of people uh, an alternative to spend their time and um, engage in competitions. And um, maybe that's an idea we can also do. And um, um, I've seen the, I've seen the competition, and I, I cannot believe the quality of people I see in a week. So I, I respect Fabio for doing that. It's one of the best things I've seen that happen. Yeah. And, Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Hey. Uh, so many people. That was a good point. That was a good point. Um, I think you guys just entered in the best time you can because we're just discussing about yeah. what's next in our community. How can you take it to the next level? And we just, to be honest, for these 23 hours, I think we did the biggest steps forward together as one. It was a concept, experimental concept, and we succeed. You know, Nigel had this amazing idea and his group supported it, and we all joined forces together as one and also desk as well and also desk, yes. don't forget to... i think we're over 24 hours now oh yeah Hello. not yet we're eight <laughs> minutes to 24 hours <laughs> and, i just want to can, nice can i give uh, the uh, floor uh, to yoke uh, to to share for him what's next and then we can move to the to the rap party because we're yeah so yeah. well next is the rap party that's that's, that's for sure. <laughs> No, I, for us, I think for us it's it's different. For you guys, it's it's maybe easier because uh, you're more local uh, oriented, and uh, what we build up is not local oriented. So we, we need uh, to be together, uh, talk with people together. Uh, so we will see what will happen with this COVID thing. Uh, maybe we need to downsize when everybody can still travel or whatever, feel more free and relaxed to move around, but. We have to, 
wait and see what happens, especially for our part, for us. But local... Uh, yes, you, you guys think, you guys think that, that, like... Sorry. Sorry. About, about no. this, the, the way that the, the online thing is working, I was thinking that it might, it might make sense to have it in tiers. So, so imagine if, if there is uh, plenty of, of these small gatherings of a uh, smaller number of people who are maybe more focused on a specific topic and then eventually um, have something kind of distill this thing that you know, people find out or whatever, they develop something into one of these bigger gatherings. So besides having the bigger gathering, having a bunch of small gatherings uh, uh, which are more focused with smaller amount of people, more frequent, this kind of uh, tiering of the events has always appealed to me that, you know, it makes sense and it, 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 it feels like something with more momentum and more content. That's true, yeah. that's a good point. Okay, um, so I, I think we can, we can keep experimenting with different formats and, and just everybody has the, the way to, to, to choose what they, the, the way they feel best, you know, in small formats, online, in person. Yeah, because some things are, are and, you know, I would say to, to do in a very broad format, and some things are just becoming very focused and a butt of being very useful, technical, maybe artistic, and so on, in the smaller format. And both of these things, these things would be very useful and interesting. And okay, I wrote, to, wrote on the YouTube chat. I don't think we should knock these virtual events. I think this is. I mean, I was at uh, 3ds London, and this. I think this is is worth its weight in gold. Although technically it doesn't weigh anything because it's electronic, but it's a bad analogy, but you get my point. I think your microphone is breaking up a bit. Um, Got to reduce your gain there, Zap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but guys, if you try it out, all these amazing things you got mentioned, let us know because we want to hear your story. We can even make a blog about this, you know. It inspires us with a way you're going to find a way to keep the community going and growing because we are looking for the same thing, you know. And I we discuss with Nigel every month about 3DS London, when it's going to go back into the pub. We want to meet again, you know, uh, but yes, you mentioned some good ways how this can happen. And to be honest, I, I haven't seen Maggie for a while, and I'm so glad at least we have the chance. 3DS New York came back after so many months. I met Maggie in New York, and I helped James and Kim Lee to start up 3DS in New York. Amazing experience, guys. I missed when I, I, I saw the show last night. You did an amazing job. And that's the cool thing about this online thing. I haven't seen you for a while. It was impressive to see you and listen to your talks. So thank you for being here and supporting the community. So um, how long we have before the show? So the we party? have four minutes before the party. And I want to use these four minutes, first of all, to thank you all, to thank you for the great discussion, to thank you for taking part in, in this, for proving that if we set something like this to our minds, we can make it happen. This is great and inspiring. And I mean, for me as a community manager, this is a dream come true. And I thank you and, and even Chaos Group for, for believing in this and, and doing it. And so we have two winners that we need to announce before anything else. Um, we have one raffle winner and it's Anthony Young. And the winner of the Chaos Group, uh, it, Anthony wins a uh, one-year license for Autodesk 3ds Max, for V-Ray or Corona, for signing software, and uh, one ticket for Creative Lightning's, um, Lightning's class. Right. And also we have Marius, Marius Eliquis Roski from Poland. Right. I'm, I'm very sorry for not pronouncing the name correctly, but uh, yes, you're, you're winning the Chaos Group swag. Congratulations, guys. Uh, we'll get in touch with you or you will get in touch with us, but we'll figure out ways to give you the awards after the show. And yeah, I think we're ready to start a party. <laughs> yeah, it's party time. So yeah, I would like to say thank you as, as well to all the host, panelists, guests. You guys did an amazing job to bring us all together uh, as one group, yeah. one community. And of course, the audience, you know. They're being active. I, I really enjoy that. So congratulations to all the audience that they've been with us so long. It's amazing, guys. Seriously, I, I was watching all the time and I can see people getting engaged. I just want to say thank you. So what's the plan for the party then? Nigel. Nigel.
you're the party guy. Can, <laughs> can I come off mic now? Yes. Um, yeah. So what I've noticed over the last 24 hours is I didn't have enough guitars behind me. So I've gone out there, you know, and joined the, because, you know, this seems to be like a guitar club. Hopefully, you know, what I've got meets everybody's uh, expectations. Uh, That's Kim? a violin, Zap. That's not a guitar. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was, I immediately noticed your background when they let me into the room. I'm like, oh, somebody, somebody felt left out. <laughs> oh, I, 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 envy, guitar envy, all round. Um, how's everyone feeling? Great. Great, good. Um, before we begin, I don't know how all the hosts and participants feel, but I would like the other Teddy and the production crew who are in the other room from Teddy to come and join Teddy just for a few moments so we can all celebrate what they have achieved for us. Can they do that, Teddy? Absolutely, yeah, guys. Get them to come through. Let's all meet them. I think our audience at home want to know who's pulled this off. <laughs> and we want to see likes, please. We'd like to see lots of likes, lots of love for these guys because they haven't slept. They've been there. They've, they've, <laughs> maybe we'll talk about some of the uh, Mark Zuckerberg problems we had earlier. Um, but here they are. Let's let's. Agreed, Nigel. Show business rule 101. <laughs> Always thank the crew. Always thank the crew. <laughs> Have they gone to sleep? They've gone to sleep. Oh, here they are. Here they are. You guys are awesome. Hi, hey. Teddy. You guys are amazing. Nice. Yes. There you are. Congratulations. Amazing, guys. We, we want to hear from them. Oh, uh, we were muted? The oh, oh. Eh, well, I ruined it. Sorry, I ruined it. <laughs> Dancho, how are you feeling? Dancho says he's great. He feels great. He never uh, and either what, way. What, so. <laughs> what happened to other Teddy? Can we bring other Teddy back, please? How many Teddies do we have? Three or four. Infinite amount of Teddies. <laughs> You should see how many Yvonne's they have, and, and, and I think that's 10% of our workforce at, uh, at Chaos Group is Yvonne's. <laughs> we have a few too. Teddy, have we lost other Teddy? No more Teddy's? She's, she's shy. Oh. Hey, There's some Nigel serious is... moray pattern going on on Lar right oh. now. It's what? Pretty... Nigel, what? <laughs> hey, Teddy. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Did you Congratulations, you guys. Teddy? Yeah. yeah, you don't hear anything. Let me just. <laughs> Can you hear now? End of the show. How is it feeling? Amazing. Amazing. We made it. Thank you. Thank you. I think we made it. I'm not sure. Awesome yeah. work, guys. Yeah, wow. it ended up being really amazing. Technical issue. <laughs> technical issue. <laughs> no, no, no technical issue. Bye. <laughs> I mean, surprising, surprising how. It, whatever technical issues we had, they were extremely minor, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's really incredible, really incredible. I screwed up my music quite bad, but hey. No, no. Uh, no. You're the only one uh, thinking well, about it. Let, let's, let's start with that. Had, what shows had music on? Any highlights for people? I know Zap, that, that was quite special. <laughs> Um, yeah, Australia, we had Andre, he, he got on the sax. Yeah. Um, we had Matthew so, Bannister's yes. Bannister. video. Beautiful video. Video. Amazing work. Who else had smoke and lasers, though? Who else had smoke and lasers? Just you, just you, Zap. <laughs> Live Johnny. from Las Vegas. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can't have a party without smoke and lasers. No, everyone seems very quiet, um, very, very subdued. I think um, we can unmute ourselves. Are you drinking about. champagne, Nigel? As a well, little we're drinking water, Nigel. We'll have to get the drinks. Well, well go and grab <laughs> a drink, everyone. I don't care where you are in the world. Grab a drink. This I have a, one already. 
No, of course you do. I'm going to grab a drink and say hi to James from Philippines and Europe. I haven't seen you guys for 80. We deserve to have a drink. Hey, Nikos. Hello, hi, Nikos. Hey, guys, I'm missing you. You know that. Did you watch the New York show last night? Of course I watched the show. And then I was like, yeah. 3 a.m., I have to go to bed. Stop, start playing music. I get excited when 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Like next you, people, Nikos. I mean, you would have seen you would have seen in the three D in the three D New York show that there was photographs of you. Uh, yeah, okay, so were. you were part of the first uh, oh, third show too. I would love three that. Yeah, I would love that. We did a we did a little brief history of three D New York, uh, and uh, obviously you were. You were it was, it was basically of photos show. of Nikos, I think. <laughs> <laughs> many complained that there was too many photos of. No, no, there's, there's no, never too many photos of me. It was great to see. He's just so handsome. I think you have to be good memories, guys. It was amazing. So has anyone been keeping okay. an eye so, on did... our audience and who's actually stayed with us? How, how many people have actually stayed for the whole 24 hours? Do we know? Mm, no, we don't, but we can ask them now. I know okay. Mike, my uh, Drockies, Mike Golden. He actually stayed for many sessions. He stayed for we, a lot, and we and chatted. He was, on, he was on two channels. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> multi-channel. Yeah, I, I was totally do, dead after hours. So I, 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 sorry, Chris, I slept through most of of LA. That's so. okay, Zap. We we missed. You know, you were important <laughs> other places. <laughs> okay, we've got people posting who've been with us the whole time. So let's celebrate them. Wow, that's Who's nice. Who's that? Oh, really? uh, Yes. Should, we, should we ask if they have jobs? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. If we can do, that. Um, do we really need to do that? They don't have jobs, have jobs now. Just stay for 24 hours and watch that. I'll give them a job. Yeah, there we go. It's a great effort, everybody. A really good effort. Um, well, should we recap? Because I don't think. Well, apart from. The people who have stayed up for 24 hours, everyone's seen all the shows. Josh, do you want to get off your mobile phone and talk about show one? Doesn't look oh, like he wants to do uh, that. Actually, Josh is probably working. So um, I can't believe that it was literally 24 hours ago that I started, I sat down at this desk and got in front of the screen. Um, it's five months since we came up with this crazy idea. And Teddy, how do you feel about it? Um, well, I, I think I, I said at the end of show 10 that for me, this is really a dream come true. Because there were, first when we started bouncing this idea between each other, I think both of us were very excited about it, but none of us really believed that it would happen because it just required coordination between so many people and then today I had to pinch myself seeing so many of you and actually appreciating all the work that you did for the show because everybody took it so seriously and you prepared and you gave your best and it showed I think it showed well I think everybody gave their best yeah. it's been it's been great but um so you're up for doing it again next week Oh, next say. week, I, I think <laughs> Monthly, I'm... Monthly, surely. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Um, and Melissa... How, how hard can it be? I know, it's just... Guys, can we give a shout out to Melissa and the design team? Because yeah. I think they did an amazing job with the graphics. And yes. Just, and yes. Everything you, you saw. Plamy, yeah. work. Everything yeah. you saw, it's Melissa again, Flammy, and they worked so hard for so many you have no idea how many pieces of graphics we have melissa can tell more but it's, it's a lot <laughs> yeah there was a lot well it was ever expanding wasn't it because we started out thinking we might we'd have 30 speakers and then by the end of it we just over 100 people on air over the past 24 hours with posts and, and speakers coming in so yeah, well, well a lot of name captions <laughs> I, I i think melissa at the yeah. beginning you sort of suggested to teddy just just keep it small keep keep it real keep it small but but we may have got a bit excited and got a bit well 
we delegated to the host, and let's bring the hosts in on this. We said to the host, look, these are your shows. We want to hear from your local communities. Tell us your stories. So we passed them over. So it's, it's really the host's fault that it grew so big. Nice. That's the blame. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're happy should... to take the blame. <laughs> we should you know be forever what? grateful to the host. <laughs> I really love the fact that, you know, as soon as I, I tuned in and I was watching the countdown on YouTube, and I saw the first comment was, Hi from Denmark. And it was, Hi from Nepal. And I'm just amazed that how, you know, we had it in our. Africa. It wasn't until I started in the way we hoped it would. So I, I'm just thrilled that um, you know we've we've been able to do this and make it all inclusive, and hopefully everyone's felt that they've been represented, and you know their particular interests have been represented, and their country, and you know. Their, their community in, in a small part has expanded something really big. Well, I've just said on, on YouTube, because that, that's a great point. We, we've still got quite a lot of viewers. Um, people who are watching, tell us where you are, where you're watching from. I mean, um, even on this call now, like with my morning sunshine coming through, because <laughs> I've, I've been asleep and woken up and put a new Total Chaos t-shirt on. <laughs> So it's uh, it's just crazy how we're we're all being able to use this technology and and come together and you know. It, it anyway, I've also gotten a lot of comments not not just in the chat but just in emails and and, and messages from people saying that th this format is actually surprisingly amazing and they just were so excited and they can't wait to have it again i know we're not going to do it next week but uh <laughs> but i think that that's something that we should uh, we should consider like it was really great and i think everyone come together and look at all these everyone's smiling so i think we're all doing a good even though we have a lack of sleep so it's really cool yeah and i think what what's been great is the journey around the world and ronaldo had in do you want to jump in here uh from bali it's, yeah. What time is it for you right now? Uh, one, 1.40 a.m. in the morning. That's a fine effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we are 3D artists. We we work late all the time. <laughs> and also, one more thing. I don't know if you noticed, but we actually gathered um, 1,100 likes under the YouTube video and only nine dislikes. I think YouTube has never seen a ratio like this. That's the most positive ratio I've ever seen. It's great. We did well. Yeah, it's great. Well, it's a pretty positive community. And I think what, what I'm buzzing with is I've had 24 hours of absolute enthusiasm for CG. And it's like every single talk, every single person talking on this is just oozing with, they love it. And it's being like, it's, it's, well, it's like going to a music festival. I also want to do a shout out to the Twitch, our Twitch channel, because our Twitch channel is kind of a new thing. And, uh, and uh, we've just started, but the numbers of people on the Twitch channel has been consistent. And I have a feeling these are the most hardcore like the viewers yeah. or our Twitch viewers, and uh, really great. So shout out to the all. The quality that. is also best on Twitch. I don't know what they're doing. That's what I noticed. Well, on my it's designed too. for this. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's designed for this. So we're definitely. I think we're. You know, Lon and I are talking about doing more Twitch shows. And you know, some of the. You know, uh, some of the speakers were only allowed 24 minutes, but they had like three hours of material to present. So I think that we're gonna. You know, people like Ian and uh, Spriggs and Chris uh, and Kirsten and, and uh, even Sonia. I think. We should do a whole like three hours with Sonia about her stuff. So it'd be really cool. Um, so anyway, so the Twitch channel, I think is something we're definitely going to explore more and, and have more of the community involved and sort of if, if anyone out there who's, who's uh, listening has ideas of who they'd like to have a long format to hang out with, uh, it, just let us know. We'd love to, to, to make that happen. Have you guys think about the um, recording? Because I know a lot of people have been mentioning on the comments about, you know, are they going to be able to watch this again 
at some point. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Because I know you've, you've been filling in, but the comments go so fast, people might not have spotted it. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, our goal is to release the content, like edit the recording, the 24 hour recording and uh, cut it into smaller sessions that are consumable actually and what people can watch. And of course we'll upload these that um, the presenters allow us and, and give us the permission to. So we, we just have some work to do on the back end, and whenever when we're ready, we'll we'll share those sessions that are that can be available. I think you actually can go back on Twitch for a while also and just immediately it automatic. It's like we don't need to do anything. You can go back and watch it. The whole thing? Yeah. Oh. I, you, I could actually do it earlier. I could watch back earlier today from stuff while it was streaming. It's yeah, techno yeah, yeah. technology somehow. It, it gives the option, but the thing is that some of the presenters would rather not have uh, the presentations stay after the, the live. So we, of course, want to uh, want to comply with with their will. So, sorry, I, I'll stop speaking in English because, as I mentioned, I've not slept for some time. <laughs> My English is not the best. <laughs> Your English is fine. Wait until I stop speaking Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds nothing like the Swedish chef, by the way. He's clearly Norwegian. <laughs> Our, the English-speaking people aren't that good at English, so don't feel bad. No. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so which is your favorite part of the show? Or the funniest part? I don't know, Nigel. Do you have a set of questions? Well, uh, let's start with Zap. <laughs> uh, Let's let's all let's all the elephant in the room. Um, it 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 was. I think it, it was it was Zap, right? Let's let's all. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna re. Is it you're gonna redo it tonight or right um soon for us, Zap? I can do a rerun, an updated rerun if you want. Sure. But it it was a the twenty four hours of chaos song. It was. Um. <laughs> I can do a better one. Is there a yeah. single coming out sometime soon? Probably not. <laughs> so that that's the thing that is so liberating what I've started doing on Twitch because I used to do music for a long time, but you end up this, oh, I have to finish this song and you have to do things. But what I do on Twitch, I do some random crap, I play something and then I just delete it. And then I do something else. You don't have to finish anything. There's no polish, there's no nothing. It's so wonderfully glorious. So. But for you guys, I might actually polish up a 24 hours of chaos song if you want me to, but we'll see. You have to we'll see have to come up with at least one. Well, we, should we wait for the end for that to play us out? Sure, why not? Yeah. Um, Josh. I'm here. Shall we hey, talk Josh. about, shall we quickly go through a recap? Shall we talk about show one? For people, yeah, for absolutely. our... For our viewers who didn't tune in from the beginning, um, do you think we did well? I think it went pretty well, um, considering the usual number of stuff ups that we seem to get <laughs> into a show. We actually managed to finish pretty early, so we had, had a bit of fill time as well, which is pretty unusual for us as well. Um, no, I thought it went really well. I think Rune's presentation was. Um, short and succinct and to the point and um, you know and his work is incredible and he shared some very valuable ideas um, and then um, uh, Nick from Uniform was was uh, amazing as well and um, shared some really valuable insights into how Uniform um, approached their work and I you know and the, the quality of their work is outstanding as well and then Kate from the mill she was um she was fantastic as well, and she showed um, uh, a fantastic um, a TVC <laughs> for BMW. And yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, all three presentations were outstanding. Yeah, uh, I've watched, I've watched a, a, quite a few going around the world as well, and they've all been really good, to be honest. Uh, popping in and out. It's well, I think on that note, let's jump to show two. Um, should what note on happened? show two that 
that Bruno, your your um, uh, your friend in the background, has been extremely committed to constantly interrupting your. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but the office is super clean. <laughs> it's been it's vacuumed for twenty four hours. <laughs> I will never forget my first Bruno, we have one Bruno. more Roomba for you. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Did Ricardo just leave us? Should we go to show three? New York. Yeah, I Take thought it was, uh, it was... Hey. I thought it was fun. It was... We were probably the least technical show, or one of the least. I, did, I was not able to watch all of them. But uh, I hope that the audiences take from it that the fact that we did not have a lot of your industry standard demos and deep dives into how things were done, which is great, which we figured everybody else is going to be representing plenty. We hope that people, some uh, audience can appreciate the deeper dive into the people like Matthew Bannister, like more than just him talking about D box, which I'm sure he's, over 15, 20 years now, he's sick of being asked questions about D-Box. Yeah. A little bit into the person that made, that became the founder, you know, and what he deals with and how human he is compared to everybody out there who has problems or deals with life, things like that. So hopefully that and touching on the subjects that the round table talked about um, that are social and things that are contextual to the world right now, even though they're not CG topics. No, it was, it was really interesting. It was very topical, touching on diversity, um, which it's, yeah, it was great. Well, I hope so, because I'm sure there are some viewers who were like, wait a minute, why are they not showing me how to do something in the package or with the renderer? But, you well, know, I think there's different we kinds of presentations. You know, I mean, you guys had a really great open that. discussion about stuff, and I think it was a really good to, to mm. have that. I mean, it's not just all about demos, you know. It's not. It's about. It's about community, and it's about uh, uh, understanding how we all feel the same things. And you guys did a great job with that, for sure. Great, great. Thanks. It's yeah. Good to well, hear. I well, I think that that's. Camera, it was like. Uh, it was more in line with, like, I guess, what our normal events are like, and I think we wanted to kind of show what the normal three New York events are like, and they tend to be a little bit less technical, more artistic but also for us it's always about getting people together and getting to know each other so i thought i think our event was the whole how can we how can we uh distill what freedom new york is all about into a two-hour thing and, and and try and convey what we try and do in the industry normally in non-covid times when we can meet in person but how can we do that in a in a zoom show uh you know because we knew that there was going to be a lot of uh, presentation focusing on the work, focusing on techniques, focusing on software, and they were all great. Um, but so we were like, well, let's try and let's try and do something a little bit different. And uh, I think it was successful. I think we got a lot of positive responses, and people seemed to respond pretty well to it. Um, as Kim said, it was a bit of a departure from what some people might have been expecting, but I think that's good because that's kind of what our what our actual event is like in, in the real world too. Yeah, but yeah, it was it was really it was really a lot of fun. And I think, you know, the conversations that we all had, you know, with Matthew and also with the roundtable, I think those conversations could have easily been, you know, 40 minutes long, two hours long. And I think it's it's good to just really plant that seed to have these discussions. And hopefully these events in the future will, you know, continue promoting dialogue between the community about all these issues that we have right now. Yeah. Um, just to bring you all, oh no, we're back again. We just I dropped think, off. I think the, the crowning genius of the London show, of course, was watching Simon eat spaghetti bolognese at the end. I agree. It was agreed. agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually asked by one of the guests today, you know, can we do that? Uh, I'm, I'm what like, are you going to eat? <laughs> I'm like, sure, well, go you, ahead. If you've got Nikos doing a drink session, no, a mixology. We, we got food in there now as well. Yeah, you've got oh, room. You've got room for one food days. segment. We did I've, have, I've we did have a minor Nikos. panic on our uh, on our show when uh, after the uh, I guess what we call the Katy Perry incident of the. Uh, oh. Oh yeah. We did have a minor minor panic about whether Matthew's uh, distribution company were going to be as actively checking. Uh, Facebook feeds as Kate Perry's record label were. Unfortunately, I don't think they I don't think they were looking for 
quite. I think there was a there was a, a moment when people were very upset about the spaghetti because he was using a, a knife to cut the spaghetti, and that was a big. <laughs> That's even more hard. <laughs> Ouch! It's and like eating, eating sushi with the fork. Fabio was very upset with that. He was. He was. And it's, Fabio, it's... and he's right to be. Mm. I, I think all of my mm. Italian friends turned off as soon as people Polonaise saw some spaghetti, so they probably missed that part. What? Well, shall we talk about Montreal? Let's not. <laughs> be, Mon Montreal, Montreal, Montreal beyond that. <laughs> well, one thing that was great, we had a bunch of speakers who actually, they were doing presentation for the first time. Like we had Jeremy, we had Samia live from Qatar at 4 a.m. in the morning. And Daniela also talking about zombies, archviz, and alien butt crack. That was, that was fantastic. <laughs> and we had Zap, of course. And then, so, so I missed the tail end of your show because that, that was bedtime for me. And, and of course, I missed half of LA as well. So you guys have to bring me up to speed. What did I miss? What did you miss? You actually missed, have you seen the uh, Terry from Normally presentation? I, I, I watched that. Yeah, that was, to me, that was like very good because we used to see Archviz being used to sell new condos, but they were kind of using it in an inspiring way, you know, to spark discussion and to raise awareness about poverty in Canada, which is uh, kind of concerning. So I really enjoyed that, that presentation. And we have, unfortunately, we had to cut our last speaker. We were kind of, we had a very jam-packed and tight schedule. And unfortunately for Antoine, we had to cut him at the end. We're gonna make it up for him, and we felt very bad. But uh, we're gonna, he'll be back. We we had a tight schedule. I know. It's kind of impressive that even for 44 hours, we went over only what 10 minutes or something like that at the end. If it was 44 hours, I think we'd all be dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, 24, 24. 24. Um, Chris, do you want to tell us about LA? Four hours. You had the longest show. We we did. And honestly speaking, I mean, first of all, big shout out to, to Melissa again for being such an amazing person and helping organize this because Melissa's awesome as she is. And all I really had to do, honestly, is just show up. So I did that. Uh, and uh, she, she made sure everything else worked uh, really well. But we did have some really great speakers um, and it turned out uh, really well. Um, I think uh, Justin did a really good job uh, talking about some of the cool stuff he's doing over at Blur. Uh, and, you know, it was really nice to have old, some of our old friends on and, and talking about those those things. Asuka did, I don't know if you guys saw that, how, did some of you guys watch the LA show? I mean, the Asuka's presentation was like, if any of you guys are into digital humans, it's uh, it's gonna, it'll blow you away. Uh, so she did an incredible job, uh, obviously, with the, the, the digital human work they're doing at, at DD. And uh, we also had uh, Ian Spriggs come on, and he tried to condense a four-hour presentation into 24 minutes. Didn't quite work out because I think he had oh, 120 slides, which was really impressive. I think. He had 120 was... slides to show in 24 minutes. Oh, so it's not... slide 48. <laughs> it was Andre from the THU tribe. Yeah. <laughs> him that sadly we ended on so sorry I mean. <laughs> so i think we're going to try to get him on the twitch thing as well and 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 uh we also had um a kirk and uh and andy on from a52 and they did a really great job talking about the amazing work and the versatility of stuff they did do in v-ray uh over a52 uh we had uh, uh keely Koklu from kilograph talk about hey
Yeah, yeah, I think the only, and we have one technical issue in LA with suddenly, for some reason, my mic just stopped working just out of nowhere. Uh, it was so, after you fixed it when you said, oh yeah, this was like the first mic I've got for CG Garage and then suddenly- It just it stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, revenge. So, but I had I had the you know three backup mic uh, solutions, so it ended up being okay. Uh, and then we went to, we had to cross the the Dateline, and that was and that was a little bit of a that was the one I was worried about, Teddy, <laughs> is crossing the Dateline and going to New Zealand. But uh, that ended up doing just fine. I think we just waited a, a minute or less, and then uh, it went to New Zealand. So pretty pretty incredible. Uh, but yeah, I don't. There's no one from New Zealand here. They're probably all asleep <laughs> by now. Um, I'm from New Zealand. Is there anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I, I That's pretend... why you look like Taika Waititi. Uh, I get it now. <laughs> well, I, I could be. No, I'm not. Um, yeah, the Kiwis, my Kiwi Fana, they did great. Um, it's a really small community there. Um, they, yeah, it, it was great. They'd, I think what they showed, a lovely, I mean, like everywhere else in the world, diversity in the industry, art fairs, we've got visual effects, there's games, it's, it's happening everywhere. So, I mean, personally, if we do this again next year, I would like us to reach out to the farthest reaches. Who, who is the remote, the most remote CGI person on the planet? Are they working up a mountain? Are they working on a tropical island? Wouldn't it be fun to actually try and bring them in? We do have this guy, Manfred, uh, from Guruware, who does stuff in Max once in a while. He's this kind of guy. We put him in as uh, like a freelancer for a few months, and then he disappears to some tropical island for like six <laughs> months. So he always got to get, he make like the OBJ importer and a bunch of these things. We could maybe drag him in. That will be, that will be interesting. But yeah. Hey, Nigel, I've got a, I've got a bounce, guys. Nice seeing you all. Bye, Joe, yeah. everybody. Bruno, Thanks, Thanks, Ken. Ken. everybody. Thanks. You're Chris. back to work, right? Yeah, I've got a conference call in five seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kim. All right. Take care, guys. See you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Look, um, everyone. We've done it. Look at look a lot. When he's going oh, Yay. That's it. How's oh, it going to pop the champagne? <laughs> hey, congratulations. Yay. I just want to add that uh, Assembly Limited and Wrestler and 1 to 100 did really great presentations during the, um, the New Zealand show. So Yeah, it, that was fantastic and, you know, followed by Australia. Yes, which was really great show. It, what, they, had, what? they had a lot of beers during their show. They, yeah. they, <laughs> there was a lot of beer promotion. Um, was and then the New Zealand show. No, and the Australian show. Yeah, was it better than the New Zealand show? Oh, no. <laughs> there, there's no judgment there. <laughs> that was especially for you, Nigel. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, and, and you know how diplomatic I will be with my answer. Um, no, it, everything was great. Uh, Ronaldo, you were next. Yeah, uh, I think the, the best moment on my show was when uh, VMW group uh, presented that they actually facing crisis for every two years <laughs> <laughs> because the financial on the financial uh, crisis on 1998 and then 2000 they have to uh, face the crisis again because of SARS for two year, for another two years. And amazingly, that the VMW group can, uh, uh, I mean, like they can create another uh, op new opportunity on every crisis. And that is why they have a very big group. Even for artists, that is insane, I guess. I think the so best thing insane. about your show was actually you encouraging people to um, believe in themselves. And, and I, I was monitoring the comments during the entire stream, and people were just so enthusiastic and captivated by, by your words. I think that was great. I, I, not that the presentations weren't good. They were amazing, but just that 
I think everybody was very excited. Yeah, thank you. Uh, because that that's uh, actually that what we do every Thursday with the business and mindset talk. And since we also have the academy uh, course, we also have like a, a review every week, which is we also put a lot of attention on the mindset and all what uh, all the the value that they need to put on their uh, their work. So I think it's it, we already did that for uh, since March, and I guess it's it's automatically always I uh, automatically always uh, talk uh, those kind of mindset. I guess. It's great. Um. So following from Bali, we moved across to New Delhi. Mm -hmm. uh, Armin, do you have, did you enjoy it? I think yeah. we loved it. Um, and trust me when we say that, we were just scratching the surface. It was just not even 5% of what we wanted to show. You know, we, the, the panels actually, when we recorded them, um, I'm glad people didn't really figure out that most of it was really recording, but uh, we actually recorded like two hours long sessions and, you know, just, it was just too difficult to wrap them up in like 20 minutes, all those thoughts, you know, people. So also it was a very strategic kind of a show for us, those two hours, because we wanted to introduce Indian CGI industry right now. There's so many things we didn't even touch. Like, you know, we didn't even touch my own, you know, uh, studios, USP, which is architectural visualization. We didn't even touch Arquis, right? Because we, because we just couldn't. And it's just too much to show out there. And, you know, I, I think like, like, like I've been mentioning, Nigel, uh, you know, been telling you that this is the start of something, something, you know, big, something great for us really here, because, you know, last time Fabio, Fabio came in to India, that was the first time, you know, uh, we were able to organize something, you know, like a meetup of sorts. Now with 24 hour chaos, I think, I think this has gone to another level really, right? Um, we were able to pull in some industry veterans, right? Uh, usually we don't really have community events going on here. So it's a great start. And so many of these veterans, I mean, you know, Sanat, um, Suresh, all the CGI crossover. See, we wanted to showcase bit by bit, you know, what's, what's, what's in the past, what's happening right now, academics, because it was, very important to talk about education here, especially in a developing country. And you know, education is going to change everything here. And if you do it right now, uh, we we can we can have great results in the future. And then we had to showcase the crossover which is happening, which I think nobody is talking about out there. You know, graphic designers trying to learn 3D and communicate in their marketing campaigns, branding, and everything else. Right? Let's just say it was just a start for us. We just we are just scratch, scratching the surface with the talent that we have here. And I think. Um, I mean, gratitude to you guys, Nigel, uh, Teddy's wow. one and two, Chaos Group, Autodesk. Thank you so much. And host, uh, we are we, we as hosts absolutely loved it. Our guest loved it, and I think we had a great great show. And you can do it next week, and we'll be game because we have so much content to show. Come on, man! <laughs> it's it's just give, give us a few weeks. Um, you got it. Pedro, we jumped over show two. Do you want to jump in and talk a little about that now? Uh, so, so, sorry for the, the late <laughs> join, but uh, I clicked in the wrong link and they gave me a blue screen. So thank you, Windows. Uh, but yes, I believe show two was really amazing because we had uh, a lot of industries out there. We have uh, VFX, RSVs, Automotive. So I hope everyone enjoyed at home. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate as well the show three and show one was what I watched because in Portugal was already 3 a.m. So I need to go to the bed <laughs> wake early. What? Uh, and that was uh, why we made. So I hope everyone uh, enjoyed at home. I, and uh, you can ask something for uh, our presenters because they are uh, able to answer in your email or uh, social media. They are free to, to do it. Okay. And that's it. It was a great show. Well, let's I hope. Yeah, I think it, it was really, really good show. 
great, great art. Teddy? I really love uh, the Brazil show for sure. Yeah. Brazil was great. Well, was South great. America. Yeah, South um, America. South yeah. America with a, with a little bit of Portugal thrown in there for good measure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, did, did you like my Portuguese? I love it, uh, reading your Portuguese on the chat, really on point. <laughs> I guess was something like a Google Translator. <laughs> I, I could not confirm nor deny that, that it's a very good app. Yeah, sometimes sometimes works, sometimes not, but uh, you are on point, no problem. It's always good to talk in your native language. That's right. Um, Teddy, do you want to, for those, I'm sure everybody has just watched show 10. Um, do you and Nikos want to wrap that up? Yes, and uh, I, I'll you... leave Nikos to start and then I'll add my, my thoughts. Because I, 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 I feel like I've constantly went over him <laughs> during the show and I want him to be able to express that was it. it. I think we had a great show. I enjoyed the presentation. JFX, art quiz, live interview, panel discussion. I really enjoyed it. But let's be honest, Nigel, I know the highlight for you was once Christo said, Fast organizing about this event. You, you must be flying all over the world when you share this, right? I, I, don't, I couldn't hear what, what did you say? You said about something that like the event was fast organized. And that was the oh, highlight. yeah, yeah, that, that gave me a heart attack. I think was, uh, Teddy as well. <laughs> it's, it's like. Uh, that was a good yeah. comment. Sure. The, these sorts of things, and, and um, Teddy, other Teddy who's slipped away, uh, who organizes total chaos. Uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of people to pull this many people together. Um, we we've I mean we wouldn't I wouldn't like to calculate how many hours we've all put into this, but it's been a pretty special event. Yeah, and also our colleagues from from the rest of the marketing team. I mean, it's we didn't do the website alone or. You know the design alone it was a lot of work done by many people and under very tight deadlines because with so many of you and the presentations and the materials you know we did pretty much everything with a very short deadline but we managed and that's well, really great well that that's actually a good point because you had a your community job to do as well as doing this as well you, you had product launches and all your other We'll call it your day job you're doing as well as organizing this so this was a community event that chaos has got behind to, to help pull this off um but we've all had other jobs to do as well so it's i think it, it's been spectacular um and of course show 10 could have been 24 hours on its own there's so many amazing companies in Europe that you could have pulled together, and in Africa, and in, and in Russia, all in, I think, if we brought back up the, the map again, we tried to seek out companies from across those time zones. And next year we, we will, we'll do, we'll do better. Yeah. We'll reach, reach further. And to those regions or countries that we didn't, didn't have the room to include or the opportunity to include. Sorry, guys, we'll figure out a different way to include you. I, I saw some of the people from the audience were asking, like, why there's no speaker from this country or this country. It's just that there's so many countries <laughs> and only 24 hours. So Well, I think when we all have some rest and we all think about what next, then maybe we have to start reaching out earlier to people and saying, make yourselves known to Come on to the next show. I would love to hear from some, some more companies from around the world, from places that we haven't seen. Let's get heard and get involved. Yeah, it's a huge industry and it's and it's far reaching. And yeah, the from I mean we've had talked about students, we've talked about education. It's it's been phenomenal. I think Christos made a nice comment in the chat that, you know, Japan would be nice, Taiwan. I think that's a good comment. I mean, the, it would... the hours and hours of chat of Teddy, the two Teddies and myself talking about when we've, we've researched and we've looked into countries and we go, who do we know in this country? And we've, and yeah. all of us have actually pulled together and going, look, we, we've got to try and find, but it wasn't a case of not locating the 
people in those countries. It was a case of we had to then, we were on a tight schedule of actually trying to pull this together to bring, to hand over to the host to, I mean, Ronaldo had a really tough job because he came on board, what, a couple of months ago? And, and we said, you're representing the whole of Asia. So, you know, can you just reach out to companies in Japan and South Korea and, and Philippines? And, and Ronaldo's like, uh, I'll try. Um, and the same goes for Amani Nishanu, if you think about yeah. it. Yeah. They, we literally reached out to Aman and he did the whole show, so. Yeah. He so, did the most work, actually. He, he reached out to me very late. By that time, he had already done his homework. And uh, I was just assisting him. He was the runner of the show. Hey, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it has been a massive collaborative effort. Um, so from myself, I, I'm, I'm blown away by what we've achieved. Together as a community. So this, Absolutely. This, this is what we can achieve. Uh, maybe next year we form a band. Since says, Tom, you've got a few. You've got. Uh, it's. I. What I've There's been puzzled, at least fifty guitars for sure. I mean. So I, I, I have to ask a question, because my brother back in New Zealand, he's a he's a guitarist, uh, but I don't think I've seen all his guitars lined up behind him. It's. It, but during this whole show, there's been a lot of guitars on show. Uh, do you play them all? Are they real or is that a screensaver? No, no they're, all, they're all real. And <laughs> I don't have as many. A lot of people will get two or three of the same thing because it's a different color. I only buy them when I have a particular need to do a certain thing. So I have three electrics because they all sound different. One electroacoustic and one classical strum. And then a bass because... And then there's a mandolin as well, you can't see it, but I can have a mandolin. I, I think it might also be a case of what you can find on my normal office, because everything is on Zoom these days, you need to make it look cool on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I have this entire elaborate setup with like lasers and neons and God knows what in all my office meetings, so people go, oh my God, that's an awesome office. If you go look one inch of camera, it's a complete disaster, but anything within the camera is you know, color coordinated and awesome, and it's like this place here, so and, and it's all fake. I like I like to look at them myself, you know. When I'm exactly. Watching, when I'm looking to, to TV, you know, there they are, and uh, it makes me happy. The works of art, as well as, as things you can play. I love guitar. Okay, it pains me to say this, but we are gonna have to call this quits. So. I, I think final word from everyone, uh, maybe final word from our audience who's still with us, um, but we can't keep going. We've done our 24 hours. It's been 24 hours of really loving chaos. And you realize uh, if you just keep it going for another two or three hours, everybody will be so sleep deprived, they will start hallucinating. And we don't actually need to do the show, they'll just imagine the show happening in some so Tom, Tom, one of the things that we, one of the first things we discussed, why would we do this on Zoom? And that was because we can all hand over the hosting to somebody. So we might all hand the hosting over to you and then oh. it's, and leave. And you can carry on forever. Oh. <laughs> 24 hours of chaos. So uh, that, 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 mm. that there is our cue. <laughs> Everyone, audience, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Zap, do you want to play? How long, is, how, how long are you going to play for? I just how long? How long do you want me to play, man? I, no, I think it's more how long. How long do our production team, who are sitting there waiting to kill this stream, not long, guys. <laughs> not long. There we go. <laughs> I think we need so, thank you. Ready break. Last word from everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, yeah. everyone, and good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was so much fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you Thank you for the experience. Okay, Zap, <laughs> play us out till they cut us off. I will try to do what I failed to do yesterday oh. by cheating. <laughs>
by Thank doing it so much. beforehand instead of Rick doing it live as I did it last night, stupid as I was. <laughs> so now I just trigger the loops that I already pre-recorded. Last night I really tried to do it for real, which I do normally on my stream, but why invite so much failure when I can just turn stuff on? It's much easier that way. Don't you think? Of course, this is my mad streaming studio where I have a lot of crazy stuff, all old, old, uh, analog synthesizers and all sorts of stuff, but let's not think about that right now, let's think about uh, chaos. I'm gonna bring out my bass and I suck at playing, so you have to, it's a decoration. I think we may have killed our production crew. At least this time I recorded it locally so we can reuse it. You just have microphone. You have to keep going. Zap. The the production crews died on us, I think. We, okay. We, they they only had twenty four hours of, of energy, I think. Okay. I can go on in depth. This is 24 hours of chaos. 24 hours of chaos. Total, absolute, ultimate chaos. What could possibly go wrong when we have chaos? 
It can be chaotic. It could be erotic. Trans erotic. Is that a word? It's not a word. I invented a word. Whatever. It's gonna be 24 hours of things. It's gonna be 24 hours of things. It's gonna be 24 hours of things. It's gonna be 24 hours. It's only us. Hey, nobody cares. It's only us nowadays, yeah? It's only us. Yeah, it's only us. It's still 24 but hours. Congrats, everyone. Man, that was killer. What a show. What exactly. a show. Amazing show. Thank you. Thank you.